Secretary of State in Michigan and in 35 other states is the chief election officer for the state. So I oversee everything that is, is relates to democracy. The voting process, the role of money in politics, lobbying, all lobbyists have to register with our office. And in that role, uh, we, we do have a responsibility to, as we often say, make it easier to vote and harder to cheat, expand access to democracy while protecting the security of the process. Uh, but my responsibility also extends to civic engagement across the board. I believe the secretary is the chief voter educator in the state. It's our job, my office's job, to educate voters about all of the rights you have and how uh, to vote and cast your ballot. Uh, it's our job to educate candidates uh, about how to comply with all the laws uh, with relating to running for office. The clerks who administer our elections, we are the chief uh, educator of the media uh, and other stakeholders about what voting is and, and uh, what is at stake in a particular election. So, uh, so we're really, the, we guard the democratic process uh, through ensuring that every aspect of it works and that all of the players in democracy uh, know their role. I often say democracy is a team sport. Uh, and while voting is the key component of democracy, there's so much that goes into essentially ensuring that we as citizens transfer our collective power to an individual or a legislative body that's going to make decisions on our behalf. And that's essentially what voting is. You all have power in our society, in our democracy. You all have equal power, one person, one vote. And it's the job of election administrators, secretaries of state at the statewide level to ensure that your power when you vote is transferred collectively to the candidate of choice for the particular state or community that is electing that person. Uh, and that's what democracy is all about. Yes, yeah, so Secretary Benson, um, another poll of hands so we can get an idea. Uh, how many people here are younger than 25? Okay, now that would mean you have not had as many elections to vote in as say you and I have, Secretary Benson. Help, help me educate our 25 and younger group about why it's important to vote. You said that there's power there, but um, does it, does it, would it also translate to say that if we don't vote, they're, 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 you're, you're losing power? Uh, certainly, I would say two things. One, uh, when you don't vote, you're basically giving someone else twice as much power to send someone to Lansing or to Washington DC on your behalf without any say. Uh, but secondly, really what you're, when you when you're not vote, uh, on an aggregate level, you're not just giving someone else the power to decide things that affect you without having you having a say in it. Uh, you're sending a message to people who ultimately do weld power in the government uh, that uh, they don't need to listen to you because you're not going to hold them accountable if they don't. Voting is, is essentially holding people in power accountable, using the power you have as a citizen. And so if you don't vote, then you are uh, not checking essentially people who have a significant amount of influence and authority in our society. And the important thing is that you have that constitutional protected right to check that power, to hold those folks accountable. And it's only when we don't use it that corruption in government is allowed to prevail. Uh, and I can say as someone who is an academic, who is a lawyer, an attorney, uh, a, I worked as an investigative journalist investigating hate groups and hate crimes. Uh, my background is as uh, someone who's a student and an educator in the de democratic process. In other words, I'm not a politician. Uh, and I don't really like the political process. I like it even less now, frankly, as an elected official, because you see every day how decisions are made behind closed doors that affect every single one of you in this room. And you're only, the only power, frankly, you have to ensure that those decisions reflect your wishes is to use your voice and to use the legal protected, legally protected um, aspect of your voice that is the vote. Uh, so, um, so there is nothing truly more important than you can do to protect our society than cast your ballot. And it's my job as Secretary of State to make sure that when you do so, you know exactly how and where to do it, and you can rest assured that that vote will be counted securely. So uh, what I hear a lot is that, and I, I wonder if you can confirm this, that the citizens in our country who are 25 and younger tend not to exercise the power you just very thoroughly explained, that is, uh, is real power. Um, what do you think about why it is that we have low percentage of participation in that power for that segment? Um, and I have to tell you, I, I suspect because of their attendance tonight, many of these folks will exercise that power. At least that's my expectation, certainly for all you HFC students. 
uh, and we, we have registration out there in the hallway, so please take advantage of that. But what would they say to their friends who say this? Yeah, it's just one vote. I mean, I'm not going to make a difference. What, what would you say to them? Well, a couple of things. First of all, no single person who's eligible to register to vote in the state of Michigan should leave here tonight as an unregistered citizen. There's voter registration right out there. Everyone, if you're not registered, register to vote. If you don't want to wait in line or whatever out there, you can go online. We now have online voter registration in Michigan. So you can go to the Michigan Secretary of State website, register to vote online. So it is, there is no excuse for anyone to not be registered after you leave tonight, period, okay? I, as your Secretary of State, I am imploring upon all of you to make sure that happens. And there's also no excuse for not voting this year because you now have the right and the ability to vote from home. You can vote by mail, simply by, in fact, right now, you could go to your clerk's office or you can send in a request to receive a ballot sent to you at your home. You can fill it out and send it back. And we're working with uh, our task force of college students, uh, some of whom are in this room, uh, to make sure there are portals on every campus, including here, so that you can return your ballot safely and securely. So stay tuned for that. By, the, by November, we'll have a ballot tracking system in place so that you can track when your ballot's been sent to you and when it's received and counted. We're doing all that to make it as easy as possible to ensure your right to vote is protected and secure. Uh, but it's a partnership. Like I said, democracy is a team sport. So we need you to vote. We need you to um, exercise all the conveniences that are at your disposal to register and cast that ballot in the three elections that we've got this year, March 10th, one in August, and one, of course, in November. Um, so all that said, uh, I spent my whole career, I actually started my career in, in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, investigating hate crimes and hate groups for the Southern Poverty Law Center, but it was being in Selma, Alabama where uh, hundreds of people, including John Lewis, now Congressman John Lewis, stood and were beaten, literally, so that we could have a Voting Rights Act, a federal law to protect the right of everyone to vote. And I became a lawyer because I thought the best way I could ensure that we were doing everything we could to live up to the expectations of those who stood on that bridge and fought for the right to vote for everyone was to ensure the Voting Rights Act worked for everyone, that everyone had a right to vote. And, uh, and, and came to see the secretaries of state have this role to, to proactively protect the vote, but really build a career around the presumption that if we take down many and fight through the legal barriers, making it more difficult to vote, then people will have their voice heard. And I say all that to say is one of the things I've done and I'm doing right now um, and will be doing over the next six months is we want to move the needle in turnout in the state. We want turnout to increase and for 2020 to have the highest turnout ever, not just in Michigan, but we want to beat Ohio. I have a bet with the Ohio Secretary of State about which state is going to have higher turnout. So you guys need to, to turn out uh, because I don't want to have to sing the Ohio State fight song at the Ohio State Michigan football game next year. That's what's going to happen if they beat us in turnout. But in order to increase turnout, we don't just want it statewide. We want to increase turnout in the parts of the state where people are not voting. And so we listed, we, get, we did some research, where are the 100 precincts throughout the state with the lowest turnout? We've identified those 100 precincts and now we're going there. I'm just going there and talking to folks and asking them this question. Because the first thing we need to know in answering this question about why aren't you voting is for you to tell us, why aren't you voting? Why do you feel, or why did you make a decision, I'll say, to not cast your ballot in the most recent election? And I'll tell you, as we've been having these conversations around the state, and we've, 40 of these precincts are in Detroit, 20 are in Flint, the other 40 are throughout the state. The number one thing that people have said, and I need you all to help me in dismantling this myth, the number one people have said when I say, why aren't you voting? They say, because I can't. I'm not allowed because of my criminal history. In Michigan, your criminal history does not impact your right to vote, period. I have sat in rooms and told people this and people are like, what do you mean? When did they change that? It's true. It's always been the case in Michigan. And, and perhaps my predecessors didn't do a good job of making sure everyone knew that. But I'm going to work to make sure they do. And I need your help to dismantle that myth as well. Criminal history does not impact your right to vote as soon as you get the only people who, who can't vote are if you're in prison serving a sentence. Even if you're in jail awaiting a sentence, you can still vote. And as soon as you get out, you can vote as well. So we're working hard with returning citizens to make sure they've got access to the vote. But that's one of the most significant things, the pernicious myths that, 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 that tamp, dampen turnout in our state. But then the other thing people often say as to why they're not voting, 
isn't that they don't care. It's not that people feel oftentimes that their vote won't matter. I think deep down we all know it does and we want it to, if nothing else. And the fact is it does matter. Uh, but laws that have been placed over time, this is why I was talking about the Voting Rights Act and the work to dismantle these laws, but laws and parameters have been put in place throughout history, including felon disenfranchisement laws in other states like Iowa, to make it more difficult for certain communities, marginalized communities, to vote, to increase the cost of voting for poor communities by saying you have to take public transit to get to the polls and all the rest. So the other thing we've been trying to cut through is the, are the difficulties, the lack of convenience voting often is for many people. And that's why I wanted to start tonight by emphasizing that you can register to vote right now up to and on election day in our state. In the last 14 days and on election day, you've got to register and vote in your clerk's office, but you can still register and vote right there. And everyone can vote from home. Starting now, you can, in 40 days prior to the election, you can request to be out to get your absentee ballot and send it in. It has to be received by 8 p.m. on election day to count, but that's it. So we're working to decrease those barriers to voting, but also educate the public about their rights, because I feel that that's how we actually engage voters and, turn, and move turnout. And I think if we can do that, which I feel is my responsibility, but also all of yours as well, to educate citizens about all their rights and how to exercise their vote, then we will move the needle, then we will see increased turnout, and we'll cut through the myths that pervade uh, our citizenry to make them think that they can't vote, or if they do vote, their vote won't count. So, uh, and by the way, please, um, Elias and Nesreen are gonna be moving around. If you have a question, just raise your hand. They're gonna come out, and, and I do wanna hear some questions from you all, because it's rare you're gonna have the chance to ask the Secretary of State a question, and there's really no bad questions here, um, because she so desperately, and frankly, I so desperately want citizens, particularly you all, to exercise your right to vote. So please, if there's a question, hey, do I need a driver's license to vote? Hey, um, I moved from Ohio three months ago to come to the best community college on the planet at Henry Ford College. Um, do I, it, can I vote here? I definitely want you to vote in Michigan. Yes. <laughs> um, please, let's, let's get some questions because that makes me feel like you're, you're really taking what we're, what we're offering here as information. But um, Secretary Benson, um, what, what have you seen as ways, because we have some educational leaders here and I see faculty, mem faculty members here. What, if, what can you give us as advice to help it, um, include and move the needle on this that, um, you know, we, we hear about it every cycle. The, the, the college atmosphere, the college population doesn't vote. What can we do as administrators and faculty members to help that? Well, you can uh, per participate in the on-campus challenge that we've got this year. Of course, we, we hope that Henry Ford will be among the colleges with the highest turnout. Uh, and uh, But certainly, yes, there has been um, lower turnout across the board in many colleges. It's one of the reasons why we created this collegiate task force to advise us on how we could partner with you. Um, we know many colleges uh, are, are giving uh, students the day off, canceling classes on election day, creating a festival uh, for democracy on election day to celebrate and make it a whole day affair. Uh, and, uh, and we hope that uh, schools that you choose to do that um, some schools like Wayne State University, where, where I was yesterday, um, they're closing campus for the day. Uh, everyone is off work and everyone is going to be celebrating the election, meaning not only can they go vote, but they can work as poll workers, which is another great way to engage in democracy. Uh, so we think support from the president, support from faculty to make sure students know we care so much about you voting that we're going to give you the day off or we're going to... Uh, celebrate here on campus the act of democracy. Uh, that can go a long way, I think, in really uh, in, in influencing students to vote. This year is also the first statewide elections where the what we used to call the must vote in person requirement is no longer in uh, effect, meaning you all have a right to vote absentee. Uh, the idea that anyone must vote in person the first time violates the new state constitutional provision that creates that right to vote from home. Uh, so we hope that will also encourage more students uh, or, or decrease the barriers many students have faced in the past when they've gone to vote. Uh, and the, I think the bottom line in terms of the why to vote question uh, is really to think about and to know that there are decisions being made every day that directly affect you and your future, whether it's decisions about your health care, decisions about your access to funds to be able to finance your education. Uh, the issue of student loans, the issues of enabling you to buy or rent property, 
Um, those decisions are being made in your state legislature and in Congress every day. And when you vote, the people making those decisions will listen to you. When you don't vote, they will not. That's the bottom line. So if you want to have a say in the decisions being made that affect you every day, vote. Because it's not just, and, and those of us who have run for office know this, if anyone in this room has run for office, it's not just about casting that ballot and whether your ballot will impact the outcome of a, in a particular race. By the way, it often will. And we can all tell you stories about one vote elections where one vote or a couple of votes turned the tide. 535 votes elected George Bush out of Florida in 2000. So yes, every single vote counts. But the pattern, the aggregate pattern of communities or individuals not voting in several elections sends a message to those who do have power and well influence in our government that you're not going to hold them accountable. And so as I was saying earlier, uh, you, you, the act of voting not only can impact the outcome of a particular race, it sends a message that I'm watching you, that you must listen to me, that you must take my calls, that you must meet with me or my members of my community when we come to Lansing and ask for a meeting. Uh, it sends the message that you are a part, an active part of democracy, and that makes it likely, more likely than not, that people making decisions, passing laws that affect you from the roads to the schools to healthcare and everything in between, that they'll listen to you and they'll think about you when they're making those decisions. And they'll ask you, how do you want me to vote even? So that's an interesting point. And I just, to lay a foundation for the students here in the room, you should know that this institution and almost every higher ed institution in the state is significantly funded by the legislators and the executive branch people that you can vote for. It, it, the, the rates that you pay for tuition are only a fraction in this institution, about half of what it costs to produce the education. Some other, some other instances of, of federal officials are, if you've ever been the beneficiary of a Pell Grant, that is the product of the democratic process. If you have ever thought about whether you want um, uh, your college to allow uh, firearms on it or to allow uh, certain groups on it, that's a product of the democratic process. So, Secretary Benson, I, I think you've laid a great foundation towards why we should vote. Maybe you can give our students the next step that you kind of touched on, which is the strategies of executing and, and using that leverage that the vote gives after they've voted. What, these students, um, many of them are from Southeast Michigan, and you've run for statewide office. You interact with leaders in Lansing and, frankly, in Washington. What is an effective thing that a person 18 to 25 can do? You, you referenced it a little bit, but what, what do you see moving moving minds of leaders that these people can do other than vote? Well, it, it's a great question and important to think about because now more than ever before, there are so many opportunities for you to participate in democracy in our state. Of course, voting is the cornerstone of that participation. But if, when it comes to the participation itself, and I often say democracy, there's two sides to the coin. There's, there's participation and then there's representation. Uh, on the participation side, the act of casting that ballot, the act of becoming an informed and engaged citizen, working as a poll worker, working to get others out to vote, to ensure they're registered, to, to study the process and, and educate your peers about the issues at stake. Because by the way, you are the most uh, trusted source of information for your peers. They're more likely to listen and trust what you have to say about a candidate or an issue than any other source of information uh, be it social media or online or, or ads or anyone in between. So know that. Know that you have that power and influence in your social network. Um, but that aside, the other side of the coin is representation. And right now, we are in the midst of our first ever citizens redistricting process, meaning that citizens right now, thanks to many of you in this room, actually all of you if you voted for the, the amendment to the Constitution creating this commission, but citizens in Michigan for the first time ever this fall will convene to draw the districts that will, that will send members to Congress and the state legislature and the state Senate for the next 10 years. That's the first time in our state's history that citizens will have that full and unbridled power. There will be 13 citizens selected through a random process. And if you want to be one of those 13 citizens drawing those lines, drawing Michigan's future, all you have to do is go to redistrictingmichigan.org right now and apply to be on the commission. The application process is open through June 1st. So I hope all of you will apply because how great would it be to have someone from Henry Ford College on that commission, in that in one of those 13 members. And if you're eligible to apply, I encourage you to do so because we're seeing thousands apply. 
uh, and out of this room, one of the next citizens redistricting commissioners may come if you decide to apply. The, uh, the, the citizens, the commission will be seated, as I mentioned, in the fall. They'll have a year to draw the next round of districts, and that will affect the groups of voters, the districts, that will band together to send people, as I mentioned, to Congress and the state legislature and the state Senate. That's representation. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so there's, in other words, lots and many ways to be involved in the de democratic process this year, more now than ever, and I hope you take advantage of them. So, um, current events. There was an election or um, a caucus in another state to the west of us um, that didn't, it wasn't very effectively run. Um, there was a, a presidential election in 2016 that the FBI investigated and at least some agencies have said uh, were tampered with. Um, and there's a general discussion right now in our political discourse that is, can we trust the institutions that serve to keep up the democracy? Um, and I have to be candid with you, Secretary Benson, I, I wonder, you know, are we safe in trusting our electoral process? Um, I know you personally, I've known you for several years, and I feel very good that you're in the seat, but could you talk to some of our colleagues in the citizenry here who might need to hear a little bit, we, we've got this. Yeah, I mean, Michigan's elections are more secure than ever before, uh, in part because as Secretary of State, I've convened our state's first election security task force. A number of experts statewide and nationally, former Secretaries of State who have implemented risk-limiting audits and other types of things to make sure our elections are secure, uh, so in Michigan and really across the country, there are more eyes on the process than ever before. There are more resources being put into ensuring our machines are secure and our voter registration databases are secure. Uh, and there are more citizens demanding to know about that security than ever before. So, and I can go into more detail, but I'm confident that the infrastructure of our election system are secure. Where the challenges to security start to exist um, is when misinformation pervades the public psyche. Meaning, and the, a lot of the research has shown this, even in attempts in 2016 and 2018 to um, hack our elections, it were there were efforts to hack the minds of voters that were the most intrusive, the most invasive, and the biggest focus of our adversaries, be them foreign or domestic, partisan or malicious, seeking to basically confuse you about the process and make you question or trust uh, your faith in our elections. Because the view is, even if you can't actually, and, and there's no evidence anyone has, um, undermine the actual security of the infrastructure of the elections, if you can't succeed in doing that, well, if you make people perceive that their vote's not gonna count, or question or mistrust the process, you've been just as effective, because you've harmed citizens, voters' faith in the democratic process, and you've made it more likely than ever that they won't participate or they won't participate the next time around. So I believe that election security is also a team effort. It's on us at the Department of State and our local election officials to secure the infrastructure, but it's on you all to proactively seek out trusted sources of information about the elections, about where to vote, where to cast your ballot, but also the candidates and where they stand on things, because there are active efforts to try to confuse you about how to exercise your right to vote and, and, and what information should go into deciding who you vote for. Um, and if you proactively fight those efforts uh, to hack your mind and to confuse you and your colleagues, your other fellow citizens about the process, then you have been an effective um, stalwart against efforts to harm the security of our elections. Well, Secretary Benson, we're almost out of time and I, I'm just flooded with all the questions. <laughs> Um, so what I, what I think would be a nice way to cap this is, um, you know, you, you've had a really impressive career, um, and we expect great things for, from you in the future. And I can say that just as one per, one citizen, thank you for your public service. It's been impressive and, um, and I, I look forward to what it entails in the future, but you've got a majority of people here who are kind of at the beginning of their life arc, at least in a professional sense. And you've had um, some really interesting and highs and lows. Uh, what I always found interesting when I was in their seats was, what, what, what did this person, looking back, figure out that I, they wish they could tell me when I was in those seats? And even, and this is an opportunity to, to go anywhere you want with it, but even maybe some reflections on failures you've had or something that if some 
22 year old who's thinking about their, the rest of their life, what could you give them as advice? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to think about the impact you want to make with your life. I believe you shouldn't chase titles or positions. You should chase impact uh, issues and find out and where pound for pound you can have the greatest impact on the issues you care about. I believe that the government's process, the political process is one of many ways where you can have a direct impact, but really think about what you want your legacy to be, what you want to leave behind, what you want to happen as a result of you being in a particular place or community, school, institution at a certain time. To be in the present and make those, make those decisions let those decisions drive the trajectory of your career. Um, a lot of people look at my career and say, you started as an uh, investigative journalist and as a writer, and then you became a lawyer, and then you became an academic, and then you clerked for a judge, and then you became dean of a law school, and now you're a politician. Yeah, it does seem sort of that I'm all over the place. But truthfully, I'm not, because from that moment I set foot in Montgomery, Alabama, and even before then, my path was one of protecting everyone's voice. My parents are special education teachers, and so for me, I learned at a young age of how important it is that everyone has a voice, and that no one person or one party has all the answers. But when we come together and listen to everyone's voices and perspectives, we can collectively come up with the best solutions. And that history teaches us that when voices are excluded from the process in any way, in a decision-making process, then the ultimate decision is not as good as it otherwise would be. And so that is where my fascination, my belief in democracy came from. This idea that we don't have a promise of equal access to educational opportunity in our country. We don't have a promise of equal access uh, to well-paying jobs uh, and a, and a um, basic standard of living. There's nothing in our constitution that promises that for everyone. But we do have a promise in our constitution that on election day, every single one of us is equal. Every single one of us has one vote and one voice that will be judged and, and evaluated at the same level of everyone else. And I thought, if we can make that a reality, truly, then everything else that we want to have happen in terms of equality can become a reality. And so for me, my work has been, if I can just make sure everyone can vote and that their voices are heard, then you all can collectively influence and make decisions that are best for your community. Um, and so I became a lawyer, like I said, to enforce the Voting Rights Act. And I started noticing that we were often suing election officials, secretaries of state, to compel them to do the right thing. And so I thought, well, what if I just was secretary of state and I could just go in there and do the right thing? <laughs> and so, or, and, but, but, but I say all that to say that, um, that my work has been um, answers to that question, pound for pound, where can you have the greatest impact, as I've gone along every step of my career and as I've made career decisions. I think on a deeper level, it's important to make decisions, career decisions, from a place of courage, not from a place of fear. Um, I think it's important to drive progress and impact as opposed to, and this is more of an introspective question of asking yourself, am I doing this because I want praise or am I doing this because I want to get something done? And if you read the historical figures that, that have the greatest impact, that get the most done, they are people who were oftentimes, let's just say, attacked um, or disliked significantly during their time. So you also have to be willing to chase impact, not praise, um, not um, pats on the back, um, but, um, but real change in doing the work that you wanna do if you wanna have a real impact. Uh, so I look at all those things, uh, and then I also finally just realized, and I think this holds true for everyone, no one defines who you are and what you're able to do other than you. You have that power. No other person can tell you where you belong or should have the power to do that. Only you can decide that. Only you can define your limits. And life is a great adventure and journey of essentially finding those limits, pushing the boundaries, doing what people say it's impossible. And I think if you build a trajectory like that, then you can truly make change in light of whatever you want to achieve. Well, that, that was, I guess I should ask for the question sooner. I'm gonna ask you a couple questions if it's okay. Um, and I have to say, you saying that only you can set your own limits. You have particular credibility if you run 20, 26 miles with an infant. A lot of people tried to tell me I couldn't run a marathon <laughs> at eight months pregnant. And I said, I'll try. Yeah, well, um, uh, I'm not surprised that you were the one that... My poor husband was like, as soon as he heard that, he's like, oh, now she's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can knock a couple of these down really quickly. Um, and I'm glad to have these. I'm going to give you three of them so you can just nail them. Can you register to vote with a temporary address such as a university dorm? That's the first one. Yes. Uh, okay, there you go. 
Um, I have recently moved. But when you do that, the address on your driver's license will automatically change to match that temporary address. Just know that. Um, I have recently moved from Phoenix, Arizona, and have been issued a temporary paper ID while I wait for my hard copy. Can I still vote with my, temp with my temporary ID? Yes. Um, many people believe they can't register to vote until they are 18. What is the truth? If you're going to be 18 in the election, the next election, you can register to vote. So if you're 17 and a half, you can register to vote if you'll be 18 on election day. Um, this question basically asks you to comment on the 1,800 clerks in our state. And 1,500. Is, okay, so, so uh, a little over, about yes. 1,600 if you include counting. All right, so 1,600 clerks. What's your view of their um, fidelity to the mission? This is not what was said, but I'm paraphrasing. Fidelity to the mission and their willingness to collaborate for what you've described as the importance of the vote. I mean, when you have 1,600 local election officials all with their own autonomy, because they're all elected, we're one of the few states that have such an autonomous localized structure, you're going to have 1,600 different opinions and different perspectives and different pieces of experience. Um, I see my role as Secretary of State as being a partner to all of our election clerks, and I believe we're all in this together. And I don't have a lot of tolerance for people who don't agree. <laughs> That we're not all in this together. Uh, and But I, as the leader of our elections in the state, um, my goal is to lead us in that direction to a point where we all recognize that we are better off when we're working together. Uh, we will listen to each other's perspectives and recognize that what works in Alpena may be different than what works in Detroit. And so we do a needs assessment at the statewide level to each local community to say, what do you need from us? Some need more voting machines. Some simply need more um, support getting their ballots out on time because they don't have enough resources or the vendor that they're working with isn't printing it fast enough. So part of our challenge, frankly, is just to sort of see where everyone's at in their needs and in their commitment levels and then fill in the gaps. And that is an arduous process because there's 1,600 different people and systems that we are all working with. Um, it's a challenge we're up to, but it is one that is inherently complex. Uh, and out of those, that community emerges a dozen or so leaders uh, that we work with even more. That's why all of the task forces that I've created this year, the Election and Modernization Task Force, the uh, Election Security Task Force, includes local clerks. Uh, many of whom are leaders, not just in their community, but among other clerks, in the hopes that they can also help us uh, collectively work to uh, move forward together as a community. But the bottom line for me is that we're all in this together, as I said, and it's all hands on deck to make sure every single one of our elections this year and all of our millions of voters uh, have a good experience. Uh, we have to recognize the inherent complexity when you have so many variables and be prepared for uh, with contingency plans for if things go wrong or if local officials don't meet those standards you set. But where we are right now is we are setting those statewide standards and expectations and working with our local clerks to meet them. All right, two that I think you'll be able to um, handle quite quickly and then I'll walk you out into the what I know will be yeah, no. our, our, Phoenix, our Phoenix transplantee uh, is seeing different weather than he or she had from Phoenix. Um, so, um, two questions. Uh, where can I find more information about my candidates? And I'll tell this person the League of Women Voters is out there. They're fantastic for it. Um, please go see them. And you can add to that if you want, like said, Secretary Benson. But also, um, would you further describe, and this is a great one because it's just tactical and it's useful. Um, would you further describe the process for voting registration on election day? Um, how is the information verified? On election day, you have the right to register to vote uh, and, read, and vote that day. Uh, the legislature passed requirements after those constitutional amendments were put into place saying you can only register to vote in the 14 days leading up to election day and on election day itself in the clerk's office. So as long as you're in a clerk's office uh, prior to 8 p.m. on election day, you have the right to register to vote uh, with residency verification uh, and uh, showing you what you live where you say you live uh, and also request your ballot right there. Now we have a statewide uh, voter file, the qualified voter file. And at every point that is updated and will be updated throughout election day. So we'll be able to know if someone is already registered or if they've already voted elsewhere instantly. And that's why, frankly, it is with our technology right now beneficial to consolidate that voter registration piece at the last minute in our, um, in our clerk's offices because they can just check the statewide file, verify, 
that you haven't voted elsewhere, you're not ready, you know, and, or or take care of those details uh, and uh, and get to your ballot uh, and make sure that we're protecting the sanctity and security of the process while also enabling anyone who wants to register to vote to do so on election day. I'll just mention one last thing on that that's really exciting, particularly because so many of you are in this room or in this age range, as we saw. Uh, last year, 2019, we had three elections, one in May, one in August, and one in November. Local elections around the state, not statewide. Flint had a mayor election, for example. Uh, and in those elections, citizens had the power to register to vote and vote on election day. And one of the most exciting things to me that happened all year was seeing on that first election even, in May of 2019, we had about 63 communities holding elections. In those communities, 400 people showed up to their clerk's office on election day, registered and voted. Those are 400 people who were eligible to vote, who wanted to vote, and were able to do so because of this law. But guess what? Listen to this. Of those 400 people, over 300 of them were 18 and 19 years old. Extraordinary, right? Happened again in August. More people, almost 700, 800 registered and voted on election day. The vast majority were 18 and 19 years old. In November, over 1,000 registered and voted on election day. The vast majority were uh, under the age of 25. Uh, and uh, the majority, the large number were 18 and 19 years old. So that's extraordinarily exciting because rarely do we see data so clear that that provision is going to enable more of your colleagues, more young people to register and vote than ever before. And I think it's on us to make sure our clerks can handle the influx of young people wanting to have their voices heard and make sure those ballots are processed and everyone's registered. It's on you to get folks out to vote. So we'll do this together and we'll make sure Michigan beats Ohio in turnout and shows the country how to do this right and when all voices are heard and engaged. All right, well, thank you, Secretary Benson. And uh, I will walk you out, and uh, Elias and Nesreen are going to uh, take over for directing how we're going to change the stage over. And um, the next panel will be on in just a few moments. I think uh, Elias has a couple comments he'd like to make. And one more time, please thank the Secretary for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Nisreen and I'm one of the organizers that help both dice together. But before the next session starts, can I have the entire M Dice team come to the stage, please? Everyone, Candice, um, Jess, everyone, Antonio. Okay, so for those of you who've had him in a class, you may have already know this, but there's been one individual in particular who's been behind the scenes for a lot of this and also answers my emails faster than most of my friends answer my text messages. Um, he's always running around and doing whatever he can to make sure that students are engaged and are doing whatever they can to contribute best to our community. And so Dr. Perry, he's in the back, but we wanted to present to him the Student Champion Award. Thank you. Um, make sure Michael doesn't get this. <laughs> uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, can't do it without students that are engaged. And uh, this group is looking to hand this off so that we get new students who become leaders on campus. Hopefully, uh, we get you all to step up. Those of you from OCC, step up with Professor Jeff and at U of M Dearborn with Professor Cheryl and everybody else. We'd really appreciate that. Thanks. Um, so now, would you please welcome the My Vote Counts panel and the panel chair, Betsy Cushman, the League of Women Voters Vice President of Voter Services, um, Sharon Delante, a uh, voting rights strategist at the ACLU of Michigan, 
Joyce Dallas, um, the director of voter services at the League of Women Voters Detroit, and Eddie Goldenberg, professor of political science and public policy at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. One more round of applause. Hi, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, yes, all the way to the back. Say it up. <laughs> See? Okay, after the Secretary of State Benson, this is the most um, knowledgeable panel, well, at least my next panelist is the most knowledgeable about voting rights that I know. And I really think it's fantastic that we have the Secretary of State Benson here, that we have a whole panel and all these other people who really care whether or not you show up and vote or whether you get involved in the process if you're not eligible to vote. It is really important that your voice gets heard. So our first person who's going to talk is Sharon Delenti, who I've been working with on so many coalitions. Every coalition I seem to be on in voting rights in Michigan, because I'm on the state League of Women Voters, is Sharon Delenti. <laughs> so she really, as I say, is very, very knowledgeable. We're so lucky to have her here. And she is the voting rights strategist for the Michigan ACLU. And we are very grateful for all her work. Hi, everyone. How are you? Who's fired up in the room? Are you fired up? Woo! You have been waiting for the 2020 election season. Who's been waiting for this year and the season to come? And it is here now. You've been waiting to make your voices heard. And we are in the season, OK? I, I, I'm so happy we're in the season, finally. So um, I just have a few slides. I mean, Secretary Benson covered a lot of things that I could talk about as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to go over were, um, and I'll have some visual slides that will hit on some of the things that Secretary Benson said. But as Betsy mentioned, I am the voting rights strategist at the ACLU of Michigan. We were one of the lead organizations, along with the League of Women Voters and the NAACP, that um, put the, the constitutional amendment on the ballot in 2018. Who here voted on the ballot in 2018? Who was able to vote in 2018? Thank you, I hope you were one of those folks who voted to increase your own access to the ballot. How about that? You actually jumped right over the legislature and you said, I'm gonna get some more voting rights for myself. Get out of the way, Mr. and Mrs. Legislature. So you did it. Um, I was one of the authors with a team of election lawyers of that constitutional amendment. So if you have any questions, you just come right up. I wrote it so I know what the rules are, OK? Um, so we're going to go through some of those rules really quick. Um, as Secretary Benson said, we now have register any time. Any time you want to register, you just go right and do it. Okay? Government's not going to stand in the way anymore and say it's got to be 30 days before, it's got to be when I said, no, anytime. Okay? And here is a, is a visual representation. It is true that you can do it up until 8 p.m. on election day. That's the right-hand column. Secretary Benson talked about that. You got to go in person. You got to provide proof of residency. I'm going to tell you what proof of residency is in the next slide. You're going to know everything you need to before you leave. But look at the left hand side. Look at how many ways you can do it if you do it earlier. It's a lot easier if you do it earlier. 
And I don't want you to just walk out of this room knowing this. I want you to be ambassadors for this information and tell everybody you know. Because you've got that friend who didn't come tonight, right? Who's got that friend who didn't come tonight? And you, and who's going to make sure, keep holding your hands up, are you going to make sure that friend that didn't come tonight knows how to vote and gets registered? Let me see those hands. Let me see those hands. So each of you is like you times, times another person. You're going to bring another person. But here's what you got to know. Get them to handle the registration now. You got all these options. They can do it online. They can do it in paper. They can do it in their pajamas and just mail it in. Okay? So that's what this slide tells you. Proof of residency. What is that? Sharon, what are you and the secretary talking about? It's simple. Let's start with what a lot of people have. If you have a Michigan driver's license or a state ID, great, that'll work. But not everybody does, right? So we're not going to stop there in the state of Michigan. Do you have a utility bill, like a cell phone bill? Do you have a cell phone bill on your phone? Because electronic copies are just fine, OK? Do you have a paycheck that has your address on it? Do you have a gov some, some, some letter from the government, maybe a financial aid, something like that? So lots of options. Driver's license will work, of course. Needs to have your name and, and the address and the community in which you're, you're seeking to register. Electronic copies, that's what most people have. They're not getting paper anymore. That's going to be just fine. Secretary Benson said it. You can vote before Election Day, OK? You get to vote anytime you want to vote. No more government staying in the stepping in the way and making it hard. You can vote from home or go in in person. You don't have to do it from home. If you want to go in in person, get it all done, in and out. You can also go yourself or send that friend who's not here. Go to the clerk's office, register, fill out the absentee ballot all in one visit, wrap it up with a bow, and be done. You could do that right now. Okay. All right. Here's the resource that we launched this week, michiganvoting.org. Feel free to you know, look down on your phone right now. I won't be offended. And you can check it out. Um, michiganvoting.org is a place where you can get a bunch of resources. Number one, if you forget what I've said, it's there. Okay. We have Know Your Rights materials that were collaboratively developed with Betsy and, and, and friends of Edie's and election officials. And we asked ourselves, what do people know to make sure to, to, to understand what their voting rights are? What do they need to know? Not what do I as a lawyer want to tell them in a lot, a lot of words, very long and complicated. <laughs> what do people really need to know in plain and simple language? Okay, so that's on there. It's on there in three languages. English, Arabic, and Spanish. So if you have folks in your community that need it in a different language, the resource is there for them as well. There's information on there about how you can register to vote. If you have questions about, again, about anything I said and you want to refresh your memory, it's on there. If you have questions about how to vote before Election Day, you forget what I've said, you want to refresh your memory, the information's on there. This is really important, the next one. Be a poll worker. That is how you are going to up your ante in this election cycle. That is how you're going to up your ante around democracy. You're actually going to, I encourage all of you to actually be the person who's, who's making our democracy, our democracy run. You be that person. You could be the person making sure that the voting rights that I'm talking about are honored and respected because you are all champions of democracy. That's why you're here tonight. You care about this stuff more than the average person. And so you are the exact people that we need as poll workers in the state. You need to either be a registered voter or 16 and 17 year olds can do it as well. So if you have younger folks in your family, you can be registered anywhere in the state of Michigan and you can serve anywhere. It doesn't have to be that you serve just in your community. So I wanna just let you know that at the ACLU table out there, you can sign up to be a poll worker. If you wanna do it on a tablet, we've got one out there, or you can visit the be a poll worker component of michiganvoting.org. I encourage you, clerks really need the help. They need folks like you to step up and be a part of it. So then the next and last thing is the voter hotline. If you have any question or problem, I wanna make sure that you know where you can get me on the phone. Okay. Seriously, I'm not actually going to answer the hotline every time. <laughs> 
because it's going to be hundreds of people at certain points in the cycle that are going to call, but someone like me is going to answer that hotline. An attorney who's been trained is going to answer that hotline and be ready to answer any questions you have and report any problems that you have. And those reports go to me and I monitor them and I solve them and I get on the phone with clerks and I make sure they're following the law and I, you know, I, I deal with it the way I deal with it. So the hotline numbers are there. It's really simple. The main hotline for English is 866-HOUR-VOTE. Write that down. You don't know if you're going to have a question later. Go ahead, write it down on your phone. Put it put in your contacts. 866-OUR-VOTE. Okay? If you, if you or anybody you know needs assistance in other languages, visit, the, visit michiganvoting.org. All the, all the hotline numbers for all the languages are there. Oh, there they are right there, too. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, that's the end of mine. And I just want to thank you all. I want to encourage you to know your rights. Be prepared to defend them. And if you have any problems, report them to the hotline. Thank you. And she, and she really does answer all the phone calls, I think, because every time I've called in several years in several different elections, she's responded. <laughs> um, so our next panelist is Joyce Dallas, who is the Voter Service Coordinator for the League of Women Voters of Detroit. She's also involved with the um, A. Philip Randolph Institute and the Amnesty International and Voters Not Politicians, she is another person who really cares. And when she came to a workshop that we were doing on trying to encourage people to use vote411.org, how do we promote vote411.org, she suggested that we give out temporary tattoos. And they actually made them. So anyway, <laughs> that's, she's, she's good. So Joyce. Thank you so much. I am very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to see so many amazing young people here in the room and some of my peeps too. So first she mentioned Vote 411 and I'm going to ex uh, explicate a little bit about Vote 411. I think I see Cheryl, is that Cheryl? Bukoff, there she is, see her hand back there? Uh, she's tabling out there and we have bookmarks about Vote 411. It is not an app, nothing to download. You just Google or search Vote 411 and it will take you to this site and you can find, you can find out, it, a register to vote, it will take you to your Secretary of State's office where you can now fill out an online application. Um, you can check your voter registration status if you're uncertain whether you're registered or not. If you know that you are registered but you don't know where your voting location is, you can check that on here. And also, before an election, once you put your address in, you can uh, go to your ballot and it will give you a sample ballot. And the League of Women Vo Voters very conscientiously sends out questionnaires to everyone who's running for office in your area. And they, if they respond to the questions that are asked, you can also find out some information about how they feel about the issues that affect you or you may find out that they did not answer the questionnaire, which may say something too. But anyway, I always say I am here, I'm not here to talk you into voting, to tell you how important it is. I think it was Bayard Rustin who says, and this is what I tell a lot of people, if voting didn't matter, why are they trying to keep you from voting? and millions of dollars are being spent. There are think tanks and consultants who are trying to figure out how to put up barriers in the way of you going to the polls. If it was insignificant, if it didn't matter, they'd be spending their money elsewhere, okay? That's, and I am a voter registration warrior. 
I have voter registration forms with me at all times. I have a sign that says, you can register to vote here. I put it up in the laundromat. I put it up in the coffee shop. I put it up when I'm sitting in a restaurant if they'll let me. You know, so uh, if you're registered to vote and you want your friends to register to vote, go to the Secretary of State's office, download a few of the forms, print them out, have them in your pocket. And when you encounter somebody who isn't registered, it only takes a couple of minutes. So you can tell them, here, I can take that, I can take care of that for you. Now, one of the things, I am going to keep my remarks brief because I think one of the things that I see when we talk about voting and about young people voting, we oftentimes, because we know how important it is, take the stance like we're here to persuade you or to talk you into or explain something to you. And I understand there's supposed to be a Q&A, so I think I'm going to keep my remarks relatively brief because I really, really, really hope that some of you have questions and we can hear from you what your concerns are. Uh, if you have thought about voting, have registering, have not, what it is that's standing in your way, uh, if you are registered but not voting, what is it that's standing in your way? Because sometimes I think we think we know and we are doing lots of things to try to knock the barriers down that we think are standing in your way. And I think some of them are. Uh, gerrymandering, um, the, the pro proposal three has changed, made it so much easier to go to the polls. Uh, made it so much easier to vote absentee. You used to have to have a reason to do that. Now you can just choose to do it because you want to. But if there are any things that you would like to say about why and why not, I'd love to hear them. And one thing I will, I'll close with this. I think a lot of times, even those of us who work for organizations like uh, our volunteers, because we're all volunteers with organizations like um, the League of Women Voters, we are nonpartisan and non -political, apolitical in that we don't support candidates or parties. And sometimes in saying that to people, and sometimes in talking about the political process, we can be dismissive at best and um, hostile at worst about, you know, like, oh, politics. Oh, politics, the discourse today is so terrible. Politics, it's such a dirty business. Politics, they're all crooks, politics. But the thing I want to leave you with is, it is not politics, but some politicians. And politics is simply the process of how a democracy works. How somebody who wants to be elected uh, brings their ideas or their thoughts to the people, shares them campaigns, wants to be persuasive. The people get to hear from the various points of view and they might support a candidate with their money, with their volunteering, um, with their bumper stickers and their signs. And then ultimately the people go to the, to the ballot, the, to the polls and they decide that's politics. In an autocracy, there is no politics. The, the big boss says, jump. The people say how high, okay? So politics in and of itself is not a dirty word or a dirty business. It only becomes that way when we allow it to. And if we are looking and seeing that politics seems to be a dirty business, maybe it's because we have stepped back and let people that we disapprove of or we don't like or that we think aren't uh, acting in our interest, exercise their power over us because we don't say no. And with that, I'm done. I see Betsy giving me a nod. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Just one, it, that was so good. She is really fun and excellent and cares. And I have to say that I've been working with the League of Women Voters for many years, and I've known a lot of politicians, and there's, I, most of them are really go into it for the right reasons and are good people, and there's some of them here tonight, and I think, it's, I think we really need to recognize and appreciate that there are so many who really care. It, it gives politicians, you know, we think of that as a bad yeah. name, but really, if you know the people, you know, the, so many of, most of them, I think, in my experience, are good people. Anyway. Um, thank you, and I want to introduce Edie Goldenberg. When I, she is a professor of pol political science and public policy at the University of Michigan, and she works with Turn Up Turnout, a student organization on campus. But when I first met her, she's like, "Well, how can we cooperate with the League of Women Voters? I really care. We really want to work on having young people show up and vote. So it's a passion of hers, I know, from right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, good evening, everyone. One of the one of the pleasures of going third is that the first two covered a lot of things that I was going to say. So it's going to make mine uh, move along. Um, I want to, um, let's see if I can get my little slides up here. Hmm. Come here, Tony. You know how to fix this. Uh, no. And on the board, it's right. No. Well, you have one. Yours. That's, that's yeah, yours. I like mine. Yeah, you don't you don't want to do hers. I don't I don't want to do ACLU all over again. <laughs> there we go. And we just do the little here. Um so I want to talk a minute about how historic. This is a historic period, and I hope that you're all going to be part of history. One of the things I want to show you on this slide, this is voting turnout over time. And in midterm, in, in the midterm elections, you see that sharp upward trend there in 2018? That turnout in a midterm, that is when the president wasn't running, set a hundred year record. We haven't had such high turnout until, since 1914. Think about that. That's before anybody in this room was born. That's how long it is. Um, it is the largest increase from the time before ever ever since we have held midterm elections, since 1790, it's the highest increase, a 13.6% increase from one election to the next. So this is an historic period and you can be part of history. Now this chart shows youth turnout. This isn't college student turnout, it's youth turnout. And you see, it's got a sharp upward movement. Pretty good. Went up 11%. Now, it's still 19% lower than the average. It got to 31, and the previous one got to 50. And so it's even more below older people. And you've already heard a lot about what happens when groups, age groups, ethnic groups, racial groups, community groups, parts of the country, when they don't show up as much. And it's not just that politicians don't pay any attention to you if you care about the environment or you care about the cost of higher education or so many other things that might be on your minds 
Probably not many of you have Social Security on your minds. But let me tell you that Social Security is an untouchable program. Why is that? It's not just because we all love older citizens. It's because those older citizens vote, and they vote at a very high rate, and they are very concerned about Social Security. I have nothing against Social Security, believe me. But you don't see the same kind of attention given to some of the other issues that are also very, very important. And that is a, is a reflection of the differences in turnout by different age groups. If you look um, at state by state, you'll see that Michigan did pretty well. We did for our youth turnout, we went up by 17%. Now that was more than the average for the whole country. So that was pretty good. However, we're not doing quite as well as some of the other states. You'll see I listed a few of them that have gone up even more. But we did 17% when we had terrible voting rules. And they have been improved dramatically because of a lot of the work done by the people up here at this table. So they really put their shoulders to the wheel to make voting rules better in this state. And there is no reason why Michigan shouldn't go up dramatically in 2020 and actually beat the levels of participation of a lot of these other schools. I think pretty much that's what I want to mention to you, is be part of history. You be part of history, and there is a movement across the country called vote tripling. And that says, I pledge that I'm going to vote and I'm going to get three of my friends to vote too. I am going to make the effort to communicate with three of my friends and maybe we'll vote together. Or, you know, I'll encourage them or I'll answer questions for them. You are the leaders. That's why you're here. The other thing I want to mention is that there is the third Michigan Voting Summit planned for college students this May 8th, and it's going to be held at Oakland University, and you're welcome. There will be a day there where we'll be talking about best practices on college campuses and how to bring those onto your own campus and what you can learn from others. I've learned a lot from others. We just bought an inflatable dinosaur. <laughs> Why did we do this? Because another school in the East use this dinosaur, who they called Votosaurus. And Votosaurus provided a fun way for people to take selfies as they went and got registered to vote. There are lots of things you can learn about ways to reach others and make it fun. It doesn't have to be onerous. So with that, let me just say thank you, and don't leave here without getting registered. Thank you. I think there's only one point that I really wanted to cover that I haven't heard anyone else say, and that is that every race, every political race that you can vote for matters. And it really makes a difference, and we want you to not just vote for president, we want you to vote at every single level. Everyone makes decisions that really affect you, sometimes a lot more than what the president does and so you really need all of those the school board the city and township races if well they're mostly not on this year but um, all the supreme court justices your local judges all of these jobs really make a difference in what affects your life so we really hope that you will go to vote for one one dot org and you can do it right now you put in your address and only your races will come up. Right now, it's got the, everyone has the, the people running for um, president in Michigan. And then if you live in the tri-county area, 
there is a ballot proposal for the DIA funding, and that's an important one too. So take a look at vote411.org. Are there any questions? Because our time is really kind of out. So are there any questions? You can just call them out. The mic? Can you yell loud enough for us to hear? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to be 18 and I will vote for 18. And what can I do other than voting for boys in my Well, one thing is, uh, you can work the polls. Right? Yeah. I would recommend you work the polls. And you know what? We forgot to say, they pay. They do. They call they them volunteers, but you get paid for working the polls on election day. There are so many polls in, in Detroit. There are 500 different election sites, right? Something like that. So if you visit michiganvoting.org right now, you can um, sign up to be a poll worker. There's a tab called Be a Poll Worker. And right now we are recruiting. I am a Detroiter, um, and I'm recruiting right now for Detroit. Um, but if that's not where you want to work, then we can follow up with you. And one of the things that's really valuable about being a poll worker, I think, in your, in your situation, is that you would really get a very intimate picture into how democracy operates. You would actually be democracy in action. And I think that really is insightful once you then are a voter, right? And, and sharing with others. And I would encourage you to share the opportunity to be a poll worker with everybody you know, because again, it's paid. And let me, just, let me just add something else. We have high school students who are helping us in, uh, on our campus in Ann Arbor um, with our Turn Up Turnout group. And the League of Women Voters has been incredibly active and effective in helping seniors in high school get themselves registered to vote. So there are things you can do in the high schools as people turn 18 to talk with them and help them register to vote. Yep, great question. Love that energy. Yeah. Other questions? Over There's here? One. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, have one. Do any of your organizations um, know of or have any program Apathy, especially in the marginalized communities where they feel disenfranchised? Yeah, so I'm, in addition to being the voting rights strategist at the ACLU, I was tasked with writing the entire election protection program for the state of Michigan. So that means how are we going to protect and expand access to the ballot in Michigan? And so I wrote a 25 page plan. And that plan is focused on historically disenfranchised communities, right? I probably don't need to educate folks who are already participating in how to register and how to vote, because they're already doing it, right? Um, and so the plan is really focused on, and the commitment of the ACLU of Michigan is, yes, I want everybody to understand their rights. I surely do. But I want to eliminate disparities in civic participation based on race, ethnicity, age, language, disability status, and on and on and on. I want to see that people are participating at the same level no matter their income, the color of their skin, their age, because that to me is a representation of a fair and functioning democracy. Can I just say one more thing before you cut us off? No, if I, I can real say quick. One more thing too. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, I'm working with an organization which is very interested. Uh, they're doing something called Donuts for Democracy. And uh, they're very interested in going into those very communities with donut trucks uh, and helping in a nonpartisan way, helping people to get registered to vote. And so there are efforts just getting underway here. That one is being uh, organized by an, uh, an organization called Headcount, which traditionally did voter registration at musical events, concerts, and so forth. But we're partnering with them to do Donuts for Democracy, and I hope to have one right here so that uh, we can have a Donuts for Democracy experience at Henry Ford Community College. I, I just want to say one thing. 
I think that a lot of times when people are concerned about people registering to vote, how do you say, you know the expression preaching to the choir? Um, we get invited as League of Women Voters to come to events and activities by people who, you know, most of the people who are there are more likely to be registered. Um, like I said, I registered people to vote in the laundromat. So if you have a group or an organization, a block club party, a picnic, because a lot of times people who come to town halls about uh, or city council meetings, those people are registered to vote. But people who go to the concert or go to the, uh, the, the picnic or just perhaps allowing us to be outside a, a popular store or, or place in the, in the community. Um, I am, if you know where the people are, we will come there and register them to vote. So we need to talk after. Thank you. Thank you. And the other thing that Edie referred to is that the League of Women Voters goes all over the country, but certainly in Michigan, to high schools. And we get funding from our national organization, and they want us to go into high schools where, in fact, there's a, not many people that are going to be hearing about voter registration unless we are there telling them and telling them that their vote counts. And that's where we run into people who said, oh, you don't want my vote because I, I'm a felon. And it's like, yes, we do. You know, And the thrill of being able to see somebody change from, oh, you know, I can't vote to, you know, in fact, he said, you don't want my vote. And I said, yes, yes, we do. And we're lucky because Michigan's always had voter, um, you've always been able to register to vote and vote if you've served your time or are, have not yet, are not currently serving. So anyway, I think our time is passed. So I, is that right, Tony? Is Tony here? Oh, well, maybe we can take another question. <laughs> is there another question? Oh. Yes. Hello. So, um, hold on. Just oh, one person's finishing a question. Why don't you and I talk afterwards? Okay. Great. Great. Take it away. Okay. So, Tony, and thank you very much to all the panelists. This is the most important panel here because if you don't know how to vote and you don't get engaged, it doesn't matter. It starts there, and I want to thank them again. Thank you, everybody on this panel. Um, I'm gonna ask everybody in the back to get up and come on moving down. We're not gonna split panels. We're gonna do both panels. We're gonna first do the community service panel in here and then the student uh, panel uh, in here afterwards. So we're not gonna rotate rooms. And that way uh, you don't have to get up and we can get through without you moving around for 10 or 15 minutes. But you can get up and stretch right now and start moving down. We're going to start with the community uh, engagement panel first. Uh, Doug and uh, the team up there. And um, hopefully that works. And then we'll do uh, their presentations in Q&A, then the student in Q&A, and then a wrap up. OK? Thank <laughs> you. 
That's okay. I don't have to like Sounding down this. Just kind of share your story. And then I'm just going to build up Yeah. Yeah. I am Jim. Hi. Switch over. Yeah. 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 No. One, number two. No, I was trying to make my head to sit on the camera. Can everybody move down a little bit? Because in the back you can't hear. When the when the doors are open, there's a lot of background stuff, and the sound system is actually a lot clearer uh, if you get to at least the middle of the room. So uh, move on down to the middle of the room if you can. There's plenty of space. The uh, this auditorium holds uh, four or five hundred, so easy. <laughs> Thank you for all those logistics, Tony. <laughs> I know. Those are very grassrootsy lessons learned, man. How was it? Jason, Scott, and myself. Jason, Is that where he is? Yeah. He's working for the lead author of. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. So we really well, I'm, I'm friends with him on Facebook, I think, but I don't think he ever goes on Facebook. He, so he accepted it at one point a long time ago. Well, or maybe he already closed it off. I don't must have closed it off. Oh, no. So then it must, must have been from long ago. Long ago, yeah. Very nice to meet you too. So I'm gonna introduce Doug. He's gonna introduce everybody else. Okay. Um, and uh, Doug and I go back uh, to the kindergarten. Yeah. God, no, are you yeah. Really? We were. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's all about the power of relationships, <laughs> right? Oh Genuine relationships. Yeah. Some of the ones that exist this long. <laughs> So I'm going to not wait any longer. I'm going to start uh, and, and I'm going to introduce Doug Farrick. Um, uh, Doug is the president of Children Hospital Foundation. I'm sure that's not the official name, um, but he can correct me. And Doug is chairing this panel. Uh, Doug uh, has been working in public service and community service uh, for most of his adult life. And uh, uh, as well as, as the other members of the panel. So uh, I'm not talking anymore. I wasn't planning on talking tonight. So I'm going to hand the, the, the mic over to uh, Doug Farrick. Doug.
Good evening, everybody. We're going to try to make this uh, session pretty interactive and hopefully wildly interesting for you. That's the goal and the target. So uh, having you an, uh, as an active listener and participant will be um, greatly appreciated. I hope you get a lot out of it. The idea of working in public service and volunteering and volunteerism really makes a difference uh, in, in the people that you reach out and help and as well as to your own personal life. Um, so Tony mentioned that I work for uh, Children's Hospital of Michigan Foundation, which is now known as the Children Found Children's Foundation. We are the largest funder of health and wellness for kids in Michigan. I'm actually the Chief Development Officer. Tony gave me a, a promotion as the, to the presidency. I will tell my boss that I have uh, been uh, put in his spot. I'm sure he'll be delighted. Uh, anyway, uh, we're here to have a good conversation. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to um, engage our panel to do brief introductions of them so you can get a sense of who they are and what they're about. And then we'll talk a bit more about what made them passionate about public service. All right, so let's, uh, I will turn it over to panel number one to introduce yourself. All right, so good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. All right, just making sure we still have a pulse out there. I know it's pretty late. So my name is Zainab Hussein. I am the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Secretary of State. I assume that role uh, February 10th. Thank you. You're here. Uh, uh, thanks. I'm really bad with like, oh, uh, that's why I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so before that, I was the Executive Director of Wayne United, Director of External uh, Deputy Director of External Affairs for Wayne County, which is the largest county in the state of Michigan, 19th largest county in the United States, with 1.7 million people. Um, so that's just the introduction. Yeah, right? that's okay. fine. And then, right. we'll, well, then we'll get into some storytelling. Okay. okay. Hello, my name is Gina Holmes. I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Community Service Commission. Um, the commission was started way back during the Engler administration, which is a lead agency for volunteerism. I can, while we talk, I'll probably explain a little more about that. My path here um, before was in higher ed, um, did a lot of things with youth, um, and then also I was a teacher, so. Hi, y'all, good evening. Um, I'm Fatima um, Sheer. they, if you wanna talk about me. <laughs> I was gonna say talk shit about me, <laughs> but um, I am the Wayne County Organizer for NextGen um, Michigan. Uh, if I can just get like a wave, if you've heard of NextGen, just like a pulse. Oh, wait, amazing, cool. Um, so yeah, so I, um, I organize for Wayne County. Um, NextGen's a civic engagement and issue advocacy organization for millennials. Um, it, civic engagement is what you just heard so much about and then issue advocacy is like if you care about something in specific we encourage you to like take up, take it on and um, and like kind of give you the resources to do so which I can talk more about in a bit. Yeah. Hello, hello, peace everyone. My name is uh, Isra Daraisa. I work for and I go by she, her, hers. Um, I work for ACCESS, which is the largest Arab American organization in the country, and it stands for the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services. I work with all types of folks um, in order to increase civic engagement, community organizing around issues that um, people care about the most. But in particular, um, there's also a campaign to take on hate that I work with, and y'all probably saw a table out there that has stuff there. We have t-shirts for sale. Shameless plug. Um, and basically, the campaign to take on hate just um, challenges bigotry, um, discrimination, discrimination and as you know there's an increase in hate crimes and it's been going on for years um, and so our job is to help give the community tools to um, combat that and I can talk more about that when we do the storytelling but yeah nice to see y'all oh by the way how many people have heard of access <laughs> awesome <clears throat> I also wanted to mention to everyone today that there are mics down here which means we want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions to the panel. So if you have a question, just step forward. And as I see you, I will, um, we will take a pause and take your question. All right, so uh, moving along, we're gonna do some storytelling and talk about how uh, each of us came into um, public service and volunteerism. And then hopefully that'll generate some thoughts and questions from you. I did also want to mention uh, as a shameless plug, uh, the Children's Foundation uh, really enjoys a really great um, internship program that we are always looking for wonderful uh, students who are interested 
in volunteerism, uh, marketing, finance, development uh, for a paid internship opportunities. So I have some information down here if that, that strikes of an interest to any of you as well. So with that being said, and after my shameless plug, uh, tell us, uh, so for the panel, each one of you, utilize the mics, uh, speak very loudly, and tell us about why you ended up uh, working in public service. I will start. Um, so I love storytelling because I think that's the most effective way to learn about another person, but also, you know, realizing that we are just our opinions, the way we view things, the way we view the world are made up through all of our experiences and our interaction with people. So I'm glad to share my story with you and how I started out in public service. So for me, it was 9-11. Uh, I was, it was my first year of college, Henry Ford. I came here. Yes, I did. Um, so Henry, I came. I was at Henry Ford uh, with my. I was at a rummage sale with my mom at the time, and this was after probably a few months. Um, and of course, my mom was negotiating because that's what Arabs do. They just negotiate, and I'm just like sitting there. I'm like, Mom, come on. And I remember a, an elderly woman walking uh, behind my mom and looking at her, and she was like looking at her. I'm just kind of observing this, this situation, and she looks at my mom and she tells her, go back to your country. So if you know anything about me, my mother is my heart, my soul. She is the reason why I do everything that I do. She has sacrificed so much for me to be here. She immigrated with my father from Lebanon, a war-torn country at the time, to make sure that her kids had an opportunity to live, to succeed. And, you know, and that's why I say where I am today is because of my parents. And for someone to speak like that to my mother, of course, you know, especially in the city of Dearborn, you know, I was born and raised in what some would call a very small bubble because we just had a very large, it's the largest Arab American uh, concentration of Arab Americans in the country. So just imagine that my surroundings were very familiar to me. So this was the first time I ever interacted with in a situation where I felt that I had to be on the defense. And it was my mother's reaction that really kind of propelled me into the world of service. She looked at the woman while I was about to like just start yelling, like, who do you think you are to talk to my mom like that? You know, and of course, at that age, you know, I only I'm still kind of developing, growing, you know, who I am. And my mother stopped me and she looked at the lady. She said, this is my country. And she just turned around. And I'm like, mom, you're going to tell her anything else? She's like, no. She'll learn. I mean, people will, will, when you as a person, how you interact with others and how you carry yourself and what you do in this world is what you leave behind. And people resonate with, with that. So for me, that, that situation just put me into kind of the world of, uh, of service of others in situations like that. And when I say situations like that, I hate, I mean, and me, it can be a, a spectrum of things, right? Um, anyone in a, in a situation that they feel, I feel as if they're being oppressed. I feel as if I have to be a defender and be able to speak up for them um, and or help amplify their voices because so many people are in, in a position where they're being suppressed and their voices are not being heard. So for me, it was that situation that really got me to, to really, you know, advocate for others and my whole life has been and and I think for many that are, have you know focused a lot on service and as their profession as their livelihood for me it's I get such an amazing feeling helping someone else I would say it's like it's got to be like a, a you know very you know like it's got to be bad because like when you help someone it just feels so good and my mom always look at me she's like no Zainab it's, it's good because it's the right thing to do so I mean that that just kind of give you an idea of you know where I I started. Um, my story um, is a bit different. I grew up in northern Michigan. When I identify myself, I say I'm a small town farm girl. And so some of you may have heard of Bel Air, which is northeast of Traverse City. Um, when I look back at pictures, to be honest with you, I look at that and I said to my father once, Dad, I didn't know that we were that poor. And so our life was one of struggle. He had to figure out how to take the farm and we could not survive. And so he also worked in the factory. So as a family, that's what we did. And then events happen and a big event happened to us. Um, a month after I turned 13, my mother who was 38 years old died of a heart attack. 
It wasn't something that anyone knew that anything was wrong, and it was something obviously that devastated our family. From there, my father said he could not continue doing the farm and everything else, and so he gave my brother and I an opportunity that we were beef cattle farmers. And so we started our own beef cattle operation. We started with 10 brood cows, raised that herd, and then by the time it was for us to be able to college, the two of us were able to use that to do that. The reason I tell that story is because along the way, I never would have been able to do that without a community that saw the challenges that happened to my family and they rallied. And so when I saw that, I began to realize that it's not just me that was in need, that there are so many other people. So my life has been one of service. I chose to start as a teacher. I then got my master's in counseling and I counsel at risk children the stories and the challenges that you saw for those young children and what they had to deal with was sometimes overwhelming. In addition, in my community, I was in Elma. It's a small rural community in the middle of the state. I still live there. And when there were challenges with the school district, when people did not trust, I rallied a group of people and we started an activist program, grassroots effort. We had over 1,500 people in the small community that came and said what they wanted to have done differently. We transformed the school. And so once again, there was trust. So for me, I've continued from that to being doing different things. Um, mentoring was a big piece. And then when this opportunity came at the state of Michigan, I had been working um, and serving, excuse me, as a volunteer on a provider's council for Mentor Michigan and the position came available for the executive director. I have four adult children. My oldest said, mom, if there ever was a position that was made for you, this is it. And so what we do is we actually advocate and support anyone in the state of Michigan to determine how they can make lasting change through volunteerism. Some of you also may have heard of AmeriCorps. So we have AmeriCorps as part of it, we are funders. There's a 25 member commission that is appointed by the governor that helps make those decisions. Doug is one of the commissioners actually on that. In addition, in times of disaster, Southeast Michigan was hit in 2014, was the largest disaster in the nation at that time. We are there to be able to help galvanize volunteers. The next disaster you all know was Flint, which is a different kind, and we helped manage donations. So we do that, and then in addition, the other piece that we have is something called Mentor Michigan that Governor Granholm started. And in addition to that, as part of supporting mentoring, we also know that youth should be part of solving challenges and have their voices lifted up, and so we also are supporting youth volunteerism. Thank you. All righty. Um, so my story kind of goes um, with the backdrop of the Iraq war, which happened um, when I was pretty young, um, kind of like post 9-11, like Zainab was introducing um, in her story. And um, growing up like Iraqi and American, I was very confused um, how to like, did I have to choose a side? Like, how do I understand my identity? I grew up in a very white city. Livonia is the whitest city in America, Per pop, like by population or like with a population above 100,000 people, I think. Um, and so that was very confusing for me identity wise. And um, the first kind of like introduction to like organizing was um, like anti-war protests that are unfortunately still going on today, which is wild because I was like a kid when it was happening at first for me. Um, and so growing up with that and then going into um, college, I went to Wayne State for undergrad. Um, I wanted to wrap my head around it a little bit more. So I got my major, I majored in peace and conflict studies, which is an awesome program at Wayne State. Um, and it helped me kind of understand it on a personal, interpersonal, global level of like why conflict happens. And it broke it down for me in a really um, comprehensive way. Um, and then at the same time, I was trying to get involved as much as I could locally. Um, and I found I found some like collectives that were like affirming to all of my intersections. Um, and one of them, which I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but it's called the Z Collective. Um, and getting involved in that was like a really cool like feminist collective that I was able to find that had all of my identities there. And the people that were a part of it were um, people that shared my experiences, which was like so new for me, especially coming from like a really um, monolithic city growing up. 
Um, so from there, I found the field of public health and realized that um, all of these identities that I struggled understanding growing up were things that affect people's health on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I learned something called social determinants of health, which is um, where you live, what your gender is, what your sexuality is, um, what your racial makeup is, all affects your health in so many ways. So it's like your day to day. So health for me like hit home 100%. And that was like really where I found um, was worth like investing my time and energy in. So I got my master's in public health um, at U of M and uh, focused on like community-based health uh, practices and initiatives. Um, and uh, after that, I have been involved with NextGen, which is, um, again, like an issue advocacy organization. And um, it's been uh, really great because leaving grad school right before 2020, I felt like it was really important to get involved for the upcoming elections because I'm like, this is the most pressing thing right now, right out of school. So um, I was able to like get involved with NextGen and kind of get the ball rolling with all of these things with like this backdrop of like public health and like identity and um, like civic engagement all at once. So that's how I'm here today. Uh, all right so um just a disclaimer my life isn't always like linear so i'm going to be all over the place just want to put that out there um so i actually immigrated to the u.s when i was uh eight nine years old um from jordan and so um coming to the country i didn't know english i knew a little bit yes no things like that um but i was a very confused kid because um the area that my dad was living in um was predominantly white there wasn't a lot of arabs there wasn't any arabs there weren't any muslims so um it was kind of, it was a huge culture culture shock. And so now looking back at it, I can see why a lot of my decisions have been all over the place, but I'm, I'm still working through lot, the whys. Um, but anyway, growing up, I didn't have as many issues um, until 9-11, similarly to the panelists that spoke a little bit before. Um, a lot of people that were my friends um, immediately after 9-11 would jump me, I would get in fights, um, the school that wouldn't do anything about it. Um, so it felt really lonely and isolating to grow up where I grew up. Um, again, nothing caught up with me about like, what can I do to change this? It, I was very silenced. Um, I didn't feel like I had a voice. Um, and so uh, where am I going with this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it brings back really bad memories. Um, so, so dealing with all of that, I get, was one of the reasons why I never wanted any other kid or anybody else to feel like that because you know firsthand how it feels to be alone and how having immigrant parents, they don't necessarily, they were working 24 seven, they didn't necessarily have time to kind of converse with me about the effects of what 9-11 could have, you know, on us. It was kind of just like an, another day, just kind of deal with it, get tough skin and move on. Um, it wasn't until college that I started learning more about kind of being unapologetically Muslim, unapologetically Arab. Um, at the same time, I didn't go into public service at that point. I actually went to school for business. Again, my parents <laughs> want me to have a practical job. And so um, I went for business management. I minored in psychology because I still wanted, like I had this, this love for like fo how people think, why people do what they do. Um, and so, and, and I had a love for people, period. I love engaging. Um, relationship building is one of my favorite things to do. And so Anyway, fast forward, I went into banking of all places and I worked there for a couple of years. I'm the kind of person that just wants experience in everything. Like, so that's why another reason why I'm all over the place. Um, and working at the bank, again, predominantly white area, not to say that just because it's predominantly white, it was racist, but I did see a lot of racist things happening. Once again, feeling silenced, feeling like I couldn't do anything because I was outnumbered. Um, I, I shifted my, my attention to doing something in the community. At, okay, at work, I'm not happy, but at least maybe I can do something outside of work that can fulfill my, my needs. And so I joined um, a food pantry. It was, and in, in just FYI, give context, I did not grow up in Dearborn, obviously, it was um, a city called Mont Morris. It's about 10 minutes north of Flint. Um, 
And so in Flint, there's a, a food pantry called the, Muslim, the Flint Muslim Food Pantry. And it was after the water crisis happened that it was um, launched. So it did a double double purpose. One, it was serving the community with, with nutritious food, but also we would host um, water uh, uh, drives so that we can give the community um, that, that need, satisfy that need. And it wasn't just for Muslims. It was for the whole community. It just happened to be Muslims were running it. Um, and that was my first taste of community service. It was my first taste of volunteerism. It was my first taste of like really giving back. I did a little bit of it in high school. I was a candy striper at a hospital. Again, how am I not in like public health or a doctor? I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and so basically that like like that flavor, that taste of, of what it felt like to, to connect with folks on that level was so empowering. And, and I also want to bring it to a practical level. The skills that I learned, I had never known like what, what a nonprofit was, how it's run, what, what is it all about. That gave me the, the language and the skill set to like actually get my job afterwards after I left the bank. Surprise, I, I couldn't take it anymore, so I left the bank. Um, and then I actually got a fellowship, which Zainab, uh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, so we were in a fellowship together and so we kind of were talking about this earlier before we got on the panel how like the world is, is so small. Um, we both joined a fellowship that also further taught me more about nonprofits, community service, giving back, and then I actually got a paid job with Access and here I am today. I'll get more into, I know I'm all over the place, but I'll get in more detail afterwards. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you guys in the, in the audience a question. Um, how many of you have volunteered at some capacity at some organization? Let's see some hands. Nice. Round of applause for all of you. And how many haven't but are kind of interested to learn more about volunteerism? Kind of curious. Awesome. Thank you for coming and, and spending some time to learn more. Now we clap. <laughs> so I would like to ask the panelists a quick question on, okay, so we have some folks here tonight that are curious about volunteerism, but they haven't taken their first step. So we were all in those seats at one point in time. Is there a piece of advice that you would give them as they think about what they, where they would want to take their first step? So I'm, I'm very intentional about a lot of things that I do because I feel like they have to derive from passion. When something derives from passion and belief, it, it just means that much more, right? And that's what I mean by being intentional. Um, what I did when I was trying to find my purpose, right, in life, and that's what we're kind of all here for is figuring out what our purpose in this world is, you know, whether it's, you know, to help people and how to help people and how to do it in a capacity that helps fulfill our our need, right, to see good in the world. And a lot of people have a different vision of what that, how to get there. But the idea is what I would recommend is just sit down and with a, like a blank piece of paper and just put down the things that are important to you. What are the things that are important to you? Whether that's civic engagement, right? Engaging in like the electoral process, getting engaged um, by, you know, either joining a campaign because you have, you find a candidate that you can see yourself in, right? When I say see yourself in their policies, you know, they're, they're, ad they're advocating for issues that are important for you, right? Or is it about, you know, the homeless? Is it something that's important to you? Making sure that everyone has a, a meal, right? That they're not going hungry. I mean, it's kind of crazy that we live in the United States and we have an issue of homelessness and hunger in the U.S. It just blows my mind, right? But that, that could be something that is, is something important to you. It could be, you know, getting into, you know, for example, health, health insurance. What? That, that's still an issue? Yes, it is. I mean, we, we, that's a huge issue, right? Over the past, you know, I want to say 10 years trying to get Medicaid for all, right? Uh, trying to figure out where, you know, you can get people to the table to ensure everyone has access to uh, health insurance, right? Is that, so it's about really figuring out where your passion lies. And then what I would do is, you know, the thing people do, like think that they have to go straight to another organization or they have to just once you kind of lay out those passions, you kind of start like branching them off into like, well, who's doing work in these spaces? 
right? That I can talk to, you know, who do I know that's working with, you know, um, with, it, with politicians or in elections or who's working with people in like medical, uh, research or health insurance advocacy, you know, and then just have conversations. And from those conversations, what you'll see is you'll try, you'll start building a concept for yourself and like an identity of where you may fit into this kind of greater scheme of things. But I always say, let it always start with the right, be genuine about and intentional about your service. Don't just give it to give it, right? We say, oh, you got to do community service. Can you sign my paper? Which is great, right? Yes, you should do community service. You should give, but be intentional about it. Be, let it be something that you're passionate about because I promise you 10 times fold, like the, the, you get so much more out of it when it's intentional. I agree. Passion is probably where you need to start. Um, but I'm going to give a couple different ideas of things you can do. Um, one of the things I would suggest doing is actually look at research and so what's out there, what are people doing, what are the needs. So the Michigan Community Service Commission is required to create something called a state service plan every three years. So what we did is we went all around the state and we had a listening tour and we asked people what were the most pressing issues and then how can volunteerism and national service make a difference. So if you are interested, I do have some copies of the state service plan that's in the back on the table up there. Um, another thing I would suggest is um, look in your area. There's different technology platforms that can help you identify what the nonprofits are and what they're doing. So in this area, there's something called Get Connected um, that United Way runs. It'll post all the needs. It allows you to easily look to see what you want to do. The other thing that the state of Michigan that we are doing at the commission is we are launching something called Interview. And what that allows you to do is it's a platform on your phone that you can sometimes you'll actually be able to see opportunities, but also you can capture your service. And it's based on, have you heard of the United Nations Global Goals? There's 17 global goals that guide us in the world of what we should be looking at. It allows you to identify, are any of those your passions? And then if you do do the interview, what happens is every single time you have service, it takes a picture, it captures that, it then will create a service resume, which allows you to be able to see, am I living out my passion? And also when you go that next step and looking for a position, then you're actually able to show and demonstrate those skill sets and what you have done. The other thing I would recommend that you consider is if you're in that time period and you're trying to figure your next step, if you have not heard of AmeriCorps, you should explore it. I'm just curious how many with a show of hands have heard of AmeriCorps? Wonderful. What AmeriCorps is, it was started during the Clinton administration. And the idea behind it is to allow you to give up to a year of your life in service. You're able to try out some things that are meaningful in your heart. You're able to meet needs. And in that, it's a small living stipend. And then in addition to that, there's an education award that you can use either to pay back loans or if you want to go the next step for further education. So again, the commission is your resource to be able to look at that. So one of the things to do as you're exploring is check out our website, connect with me, go on LinkedIn. I'm willing to connect however I can help. My past was in, in higher education. I was an administrator. And what I did do is I helped college students figure out what those next steps were. So right now, there's a lot of connections. And I'm at a very different place that I have. So I offer that to you to be able to help you figure out your next steps. Um, so I won't repeat the amazing things that have already been said, um, but there's this phrase called kill or it goes kill your idols. Um, and it's kind of harsh, but it's a, it's a really good piece of advice because it basically says like, if there's someone that you look up to and you think their work is really great, just talk to them because they're probably also trying to figure out what to do and like what they're doing in life and they don't have things figured out even if they're like older or have like an amazing position and they seem like they have their stuff together. Um, so talk to the people who you look up to um, because they also love talking about themselves and love talking about how they got to where they're going and um, it, like a cup of coffee will go a long way if you're like, hey, do you think that like, I think the work you do is really interesting. Do you want to grab a cup of coffee sometime? They'll love that. And because nobody asked them what they're like, where, how they got to where they are enough that like enough times a day that they'll definitely be willing to talk to you. And um, they're very aware that 
the that like the youth is are the future so um they'll be ready to like give you advice and like connect you to people and organizations that um are looking for people to get involved and there's no shortage of volunteer opportunities there's so many um i i definitely agree like make a list of things you care about um and then also make a list of things that you want to learn more about like maybe there's something that you've heard of or like a phrase that gets like tossed around in these like spaces that you're like what is that even or like how do I learn more um so have like a list of things you want to explore because I definitely have mine and I'm like slowly working through them um and uh and find out like who does that work and then also reach out um and I will plug volunteering with NextGen um Eden my co-organizer for Wayne or for Wayne County um, has these uh, these cards that are like pledge, pledges to vote. So we, like so many of the orgs that are here, um, are really encouraging people to register to vote. And then once you're registered, we are asking you to pledge, which is basically like a promise that you'll vote. Um, and then you'll, you'll receive like really useful information about like knowing your rights at the polls and um, where to go to vote and a reminder, like maybe you got an absentee ballot and you keep forgetting to um, submit it. We're going to remind you and we're going to like teach you how to do it. And then if you don't understand how to do it, you just talk to us. And then it's like someone as chill as me just being like, okay, this is how you do it. Like what else do you need help with? And you can volunteer with us. Um, we have so many volunteer opportunities. Um, I'm the volunteer coordinator for Wayne County as well as Eden. So you'll be working with people that I look like I'm in high school. So I like look like a kid, um, but it's like very, um, uh, it's very chill. And um, the type of volunteering that we have um, an opportunity for is like getting out the vote. Um, if you're comfortable with like knocking on people's door, telling them where they can go to vote and um, giving them useful information about their rights. Um, if you're not comfortable door knocking, we do like texting campaigns where like we text people about this stuff. Um, you can table at so many different places and talk to people about um, voter, voter uh, engagement and civic engagement. Um, but if there's like a skill that you're great at, like I would love to just talk to you about it because we do a lot of event planning um, and we have a couple events coming up which are really cool. We're having like a live like performance art event on February 20th where it's gonna be basically like an open mic. So if you have like a musical skill or you're a poet or a spoken word artist that you wanna like come slam, like talk to me so that we can get you on the lineup and you can perform. Um, and if you are interested in like climate, we work with like climate coalitions that are performing like a skit in front of DTE Energy next week so that they can stop approving all of these bills that don't use renewable energy, even though they pretend like they use renewable energy. Um, so if you wanna do that, they're doing like a Valentine's Day, like break up with this like commission that is like proposing all these harmful um, climate bills to you. Um, so we're always at like all these different events. And if you wanna plan one, you just pitch it to me and then it happens because it's really easy. Um, once you have an idea. Um, and then if you're like really good at something specific, like I said, like if you're great at graphic design, I always need flyers. If you're great at like some, like some really cool, I don't know, you probably have so many skills in this room. I just want to like know all of them and like gather them. But anyways, on the pledge to vote cards that Eden's handing out, there's a checkbox that says, I would, I'm interested in volunteering. If you check that box, I will email you and then we can talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, in case that wasn't um, audible, if you can find me or Eden uh, at some point, we'll stand at the doors and collect them, but um, just like holler at me and I will talk to you. All right, thanks. Oh man, I, yes, like what's left? <laughs> All right, so I have a couple tips, but then I also have literal organizations that I want you to jot down if you have a pen and paper. And I know this might help your assignment that you have to prove that you came here and that you're still here and that you're still awake. Um, so first, I just wanted to tell you to be uncomfortable. Like that's my one of my biggest advice is be uncomfortable. Um, a lot of, now I work with youth and they're phenomenal, amazing high school students and college students. One of them's over there. I want to shout her out, Zainab. Raise your hand. She's phenomenal, amazing. <laughs> 
<laughs> and she takes Henry Ford college classes as a high school student. Um, but I say that to say that um, a lot of kids and, and high school students let me know that, you know what, I'm scared to talk to people. I don't want to talk on a panel. I don't want to talk in front of a bunch of people. And after they do the programs that we involve them in, they uh, they can outspeak anybody. If you know, if, if, if Benson was up here, they would talk to her and be on a panel with her. That's how amazing they get with public speaking. So um, I want to encourage everybody to be uncomfortable if public speaking is not your thing, if talking to strangers, signing them up to vote, things like that. You'll become an expert after a year or so. Um, another thing that I wanted to recommend is you don't have to be an expert. I don't know if we got some perfectionists in here, but I know for myself at least, if I don't feel like I'm going to be really good at it or I'm most prepared or what, 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 I won't do it. And I just want to encourage you to, again, be uncomfortable to be in that position to not be the expert because you will learn and you will gain the skills and then hopefully pass it down to the next person. Um, another thing that I wanted to say is that Basically, not to make it transactional, but at the end of the day, when you do this work, it's not just free volunteering. Sometimes there's paid volunteering. Sometimes you're learning a skill that's going to help you in the future. Um, not only that, but I think we don't think about the things that you can't really um, measure. So, for example, my volunteering and the exposure that I've put myself in has, has helped me communicate better with my family. Like the skills that I learn have, have even seeped into the way that I interact with my siblings, with my parents. I've gotten so much more patient with my parents, um, especially when you learn about a lot of these policies and the way they impact your, your parents, um, whether they're immigrants or not. A lot of harmful policies like the ins health insurance, like Medic you know, not having Medicaid and Medicare for all, those things impact the livelihood of your parents, which may in turn and cause them to be more, you know, impatient with you or, or the frustration and the stress that these policies have on our families impact the way we interact with them. So you might be a little bit more, a little bit more thoughtful when you're interacting. Again, I'm just trying to give you like little ways this kind of seeps in. And, and one more thing, don't silo the, the knowledge that you're learning at these kinds of things to yourself. Like take it back to your family. Because a lot of times, we're, we're especially organizers, we think we need to convince everybody else to be on the right side of history when our own family might not be. And maybe be, not to a fault of their own, maybe they're not malicious, but at the same time, they're not getting that education. So utilize that and be about what you're talking about and, and, and kind of let it seep into your family life. Um, like be about it 24 seven. And then, um, okay, so the other thing now, I wanna give you practical organizations that we partner with at Access, but that I really respect. So whether your issue is environmental justice, LGBTQ issues, religious freedom, hate crimes, um, homelessness, college debt, um, immigration, any of that, there's, <laughs> there's, there's an organization for all of it. You, you shouldn't have to feel like you have to do it all. I would recommend like kind of narrowing the scope to one or two things that you're really passionate about. Um, but League of Women Voters, I want to shout them out. They are up here. You, you heard them speak. Um, one practical way you can help them out, they're always looking for volunteers for their youth voter um, project where they go to high schools all over Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, some in Detroit, and they register high school seniors. We also um, are partners with them on that project, and it's so amazing. And a lot of times we can't get people that have the time during the day, but college, I know you're not always in class during the day, so you're more than welcome to reach out to Betsy. They have a table upstairs as well and sign up to do that. It's going to be starting in a couple weeks anyway, so it's like a really timely thing that you can tangibly help them with. Another organization is called Engage. They're a Muslim advocacy group. And so you're more than welcome to also help them do the work that we all do, voter registration, getting out the vote. Um, they also, I want to give you a really quick reference. There's a C3 aspect to nonprofits and a C4 aspect. The C3 is what I, I think all of us represent, which is nonpartisan work. We don't push a candidate and we don't try to take sides of which party. However, some organizations do both. So if you're comfortable just doing um, nonpartisan, then that's what you can do. If you want to push a candidate, then that's also um, out there and available. Another organization is the Ruth Ellis Center in Detroit. Um, another organization is Muslim Arc, which is the anti-racism collaborative. Highly, highly recommend that organization if you want to volunteer for them. Um, Voters Not Politicians is also in the house. They're upstairs. They have a table. Um, they are helping with the redistricting um, commission that you uh, you can apply for. You have to be over 18, and I believe everybody can apply for it, and that's a $40,000 gig. So. I would highly recommend applying for that. Um, 
and you can volunteer with them, obviously. Um, you another wealth of information. <laughs> I, I wanted to give two more, two more, okay, just because two they quick don't ones. they don't get the attention okay. that they deserve. Yep. Another one is ABISA, which is the African Bureau uh, of Immigration and Social Affairs, and they do work with African immigrants in the diaspora. Um, and another one is a civil rights organization, which is called CARE. Some of you might already know it. And then Next Gen Michigan, of course, help and uh, volunteer with them. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was rapid fire. I hope you guys are taking really good notes. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Well, we we uh, uh, we'll be sharing this out in greater detail in the future. So look for your look for that information in your email. Um, I, I would say, you know, I wish I knew these folks back when I was starting my journey in in volunteerism and nonprofits because I did it through trial and error. Error. So um, take a lesson. This is a great uh, step forward and a step up for you as you think about where you fit and where you want to take your first steps in, um, in community service. So uh, with that, our time is up and I want to thank you all for your attention. Let's hear a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> and Tony, what's next? Okay, so thank you very much for the panel. Let's have another round of applause for not only them presenting, but also uh, their years of service to our community. Uh, we wouldn't have a, a community like this if we didn't have people like this. So thank you so much and everything you guys continue to do. And we're gonna have a, the next panel, which is the student engagement panel, talk about getting engaged in service on campus. So transition right now. All right. Oh, he's dead? <laughs> it was fun. We got to hook up Doug, though. Oh, no, I, I do. Now that we're reconnected. Yes. yes. <laughs> Outside of uh, this whole thing, absolutely. Hey guys, we got one more panel left um, before we're done. So, uh, just yeah, just make sure you stick around for that. Student engagement panelists, can you guys come to the stage? Um, and we're going to start briefly, and then this will be our last panel. <laughs> wow. um, how about against the Henry Ford side? Here we go. Okay. Real quick. Yeah, real quick. Let's get up there. So at this point, I'm going to introduce the chair of the student engagement panel, and uh, it's one of our students here at Henry Ford College, also at UD Mercy, uh, Nikita Fatima Nakata. I, I do this all the time with her, so she's used to this, uh, being one of my former students. Uh, and uh, Fatima is the editor of the Mirror News, and 
also uh, does a million of other, other things. And she's not only the chair of the panel, she's gonna share with you her wonderful experiences, so. All right, hello everybody, can you hear me? All right, uh, my name is Fatima Nkata. I am from a little country in Southeast Africa called Malawi. My last name is spelled N-K-T-A. There's no click, so it's not Nkata. It's just Nkata. Um, I am a student here at Henry Ford College. I graduated on the community leadership program about two years ago. I transferred to U of M to pursue a degree in political science, but because I love Henry Ford College so much, I stayed on for a second degree. I am an active member of the Henry Ford Community College. I am a member of PTK. I am a member of the Black Male and Queens Focus Group. I am a volunteer DJ on WHFR, the station that makes waves. I am also the editor-in-chief of the Henry Ford College Mirror News. I will be chairing this panel tonight, but before we get into why it is we are here, let me allow my colleagues to introduce themselves quickly. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Zaina Bohanan. I'm a junior at Fortson High School. Um, I sit on the Superintendent Student Advisory Council, and I sit as a liaison to our school board meetings. I'm also a treasurer of Access Act, a nonprofit group that is thought right there um, heads up for us. She's our adult ally. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Hi, my name is Sarah Noon. I am a student at Oakland Community College. I am a president of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. It's a student organization dedicated to ending the war on drugs, as well as the campus leader and issue policy director for, um, for OCC with MDICE. And, um, and I'm a, an officer for Phi Theta Kappa, the Tier Honor Society over there. Um, my name is Elias Perry. Um, I am one of the founders of MDICE. Um, I am a current U of M Ann Arbor um, student, but I started off here at Henry Ford. Um, yeah, mostly um, as of the last few years, I've been focusing on trying to further um, students' rights, both on campus and also with tuition. Um, we've uh, taken tuition um, uh, the, the, sorry, we've taken the fight for higher tuition to the um, you know, to the um, Michigan State Legislature to try to fight for um, more funding, and um, we've been continuing that fight on uh, um, U of M's campus and Henry Ford's campus, and we've been expanding from there. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Abusala. I am. Uh, a student at Central Michigan University where I'm studying political science and public administration. Um, I'm currently working at Wayne County as a legislative assistant for District 13. Um, I also sit on the City Beautiful and the City Parks and Recreation Commission for the City of Dearborn, um, as well as the Secretary of State's uh, Collegiate Advisory Task Force. Um, I've been working on political campaigns for a couple years now, um, and my passion is just helping people get elected, um, people that I know will represent my values and my interests and make a change. All right, our conversation tonight is gonna to be centered around the importance of student engagement in politics on campus and beyond campus. Before I share with you my personal story, I would like us first to understand why it is we are discussing this topic tonight. Politics is the struggle over who gets what, when, where, and how. Now, the power to make this decision of who gets what, when, where, and how, whether we ourselves hold it in our hands or whether we entrust it on somebody else to make that decision for us is something that each and every one of us must take very seriously. Education is political. 
life outside of campus is political. It is important that as students and members of a larger society, we must foster our understanding of what it takes to make these decisions. We must familiarize ourselves with the institutions and the processes that we have to navigate in order for us to get what it is that we want. And there's no better place to begin this journey than on a college campus. For me personally, as an international student, again, little country, Southeast Africa, the warm heart of Africa, if you Google it, what you're going to get is, oh, that country where Madonna adopted her kids from. But there's more to it than just that. I, I began my journey as a politically engaged student on campus by enrolling on the community leadership program. Now, through the community leadership program, I learned that being engaged does not have to be rocket science. You don't have to have copious amounts of money. You don't have to have a PhD in order to bring about change in your environment. On campus, using the tools that I had available to me at that time, I stood up against the previous administration, which I believe was putting the risk, sorry, was putting the autonomy of the student newspaper at risk. I stood up because I believed that students deserve to have their voice heard with nobody influencing that voice. I stood up not for me, but for my fellow students. But because of the action that I took then, the Michigan Community College Press Association decided to award me with the Journalist of the Year Award for 2018. I put that on my CV and my CV looked really great. And because of that, off campus, I have also done quite a bit. As an international student, my involvement is a little more restricted than yours would be. I am bound by the rules and regulations of my visa. If I am in breach, I will get sent back home. For instance, I cannot vote. But that doesn't stop me from making sure that young people in Michigan, in Dearborn and Dearborn Heights, exercise their right to vote. Again, through the community leadership program, I was introduced to the League of Women Voters, Dearborn, Dearborn Heights chapter. And under the direction of Betsy Cushman, she was here earlier on, I think she's gone. I was involved in the voter registration drive for young people in colleges for the 2016 presidential election here in America. Beyond the Dearborn campus, I am actively involved in the politics of my country. Yes, I am based here, but I'm actively involved in the politics of my country. I serve on the National Executive Committee of one of the major three political parties in the country. I am the diaspora liaison between people of my country that are outside of the country and the institutions back home. I am also particularly pleased to say that I was on the campaign team of one of the major three candidates in the last presidential election, which was 2019. Now, my involvement with that candidate went beyond the election. I also played a part as he challenged the results of that election through the courts. And I was there three days ago when Malawi announced that the presidential election had been nullified. Now this is big. It's the second time it's ever happened on the African continent to get a presidential election nullified. Malawi is now when you Google it, you're gonna find that country that just nullified the presidential election. And I was there as well when my candidate was reinstated as the vice president of the country, a position that he held prior to the election. And I will be there when he contests again in five months and takes the presidency of the country.
Now, what role did I play? What tools did I have? I will show you. This was my tool, social media. That's the role that I played. Making my fellow Malawians aware of the situation that was going in the country, keeping them up to date with the proceedings in the courts, and just you know, making sure that they have access to the information that they need in order to rise up against a fraudulent election. And I am happy that I was able to do that because I was a member of Henry Ford College. I enrolled on the uh, community leadership program. And it just breaks my heart that I have learned that the community leadership program is no longer being offered at Henry Ford College. And I decided here tonight that that is my next fight. We need to get it back on track because I wouldn't be here if I had not gone through that program. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to the next person. So currently, um, why I got so engaged, I've lived my entire life in a low-income household, so acts of service that we've been given have always been very impactful and very personal. Um, recently, uh, I went to the dentist and I got some dental work done. Um, prior to that, my insurance has always covered it, but they sent us a bill a week later, a bill that's really difficult for my mom to cover. This has been a change in the policy um, due to this presidential tenure. It forced me to be involved. It forced me to have to get engaged because I no longer have a choice. I was born post 9-11, so there was never really an act that has shaken up people in my generation um, and people that were born same time as I was as much as the 2016 election. So after the 2016 election, my identity has been a threat to everyone in America. I no longer had a choice in whether or not I was to get involved, in the choice to get involved, I'm sorry. And so I had to make a change in my life, and that means I had to be involved in civic work, I had to be knowledgeable in politics, I had to be aware of who is making us want to vote and who isn't making us vote. Like in the 2016 election, we saw a change. And Watch The Great Hack on Netflix. That's all I'm gonna leave that with. Watch The Great Hack. Your mind's gonna be blown. You will learn um, that someone said in the women, uh, the League of Women Voters, they've said that there are billionaires that are trying to learn about what makes you vote and what makes you not vote. In 2016, it kind of changed in which uh, more billionaires wanna know about what makes you vote. And it surpassed oil. So more billionaires wanna know more about you then they want oil. All those wars are less meaningful than you and what makes you vote. That says something right there. So just being knowledgeable is, um, has been a change for me. And, um, you know, like the 2016 election entirely has shifted the course of our lives so completely that I'm forced to stay engaged. And it is something that reminded me of my civic duty, something that we all should be reminded of constantly, and especially in this election, everyone should just be informed about this. Watch The Great Hack, repeat it again. The Great Hack on Netflix. You're nodding your head, you're doing it, right? Okay, The Great Hack. Alrighty, so I, I feel about the same. Um, I'm very privileged to be in the, the family, the household I am now, but Originally, um, I really thought that I was going to have to um, stay in poverty throughout my life. It was when I was 12 that um, my stepdad's family basically adopted me and gave me the opportunities that I have now. I would not be able to be sitting here right now volunteering my time like this if, if I hadn't been given that opportunity. I knew before that happened, prior to the age of 12, that if I wanted to get an education, my only opportunity was to go to community college first. Get that two-year degree because it is $95 per credit hour at a community college compared to the average university that is $500 per credit hour. 
That's pretty intense, and that's not even including the, the amount of money that it takes to live there, the amount of money that it takes to buy books. Um, but I get to stay at home, and I get to go to community college, even though, even though I thought that was going to be my only option. But it is a smart decision, and um, very proud of everyone here today who has made that decision, too. <laughs> um, so that was just the beginning of me realizing that something was wrong. And um, there are, I think there are around 2 million children in America that are in poverty. And it is a cycle. And there's nothing set up to help them once they reach the age of not being able to afford those welfare programs for them. I remember um, constantly being kicked off of food stamps or Medicare when my mom made $5 over the poverty limit. That's, that's not enough to pay for, for the health care bills or for, for food. Um, and then you have to constantly reapply. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a struggle. And by the time you're 26, that's when you're kicked off of your, health, your family's health care plan. Um, that needs to change as well. Um, so that's just where it started. I'd say in high school, when you, when you start being a student and you start having peers, by the way, what Senator ben, or sorry, Secretary of State Benson said earlier about you being the strongest resource to your peers, that is not a false fact. You are the biggest change that you can make to your generation and to students your age. It is up to you to make that difference. No one is going to make as big of an impact on them. They do not want to listen to older generations and older people. They want to listen to people that are their friends. So thank you for being here, and I really hope that tonight you want to make a difference and you want to talk to your peers about registering to vote and making that difference because in this last election, in 2016, about 10,000 votes, you divvy that up by precinct, that's two votes per precinct. That is two votes per person that didn't come out to vote and we lost. It, it really makes a difference. Um, quickly though, in high school, um, what really, really got me involved was knowing that there was something wrong about the way that the school was handling kids and um, their substance abuse disorders. In other words, some people will say addict, which is not, uh, which is a very stigmatizing word, but um, I'll get very personal here. I was, I was in high school and I was driving and I had a full, I had a full car of friends and everyone keeps screaming my name's, my, the, friend of, the, the name of my friend. And he's, he's overdosing in the back of my car. So of course, I want to bring him to the hospital and help him. But then the, the first thought that came to my head after that was, what are they going to do to me? Am I going to get in trouble? Am I going to get in trouble for trying to help him? So there are good Samaritan policies in place, but sometimes they're not entirely met. Um, I did eventually try to reach out to get this kid help, and uh, I went to a teacher thinking I could talk to a teacher. And you know that they're, they have to go talk to the principal. Um, they are they are required by law to to disclose that information, and every single one of us in that car that day was suspended, and he did not get help. So I want to recognize the fact that this was a health issue, and not a criminal issue. And I knew something was wrong at that time, but I couldn't pin it down. And I know now that the only way to change that is to be civically engaged. Um, and I want to be before my peers. So I'm going to hand it over. Thank you. So I want to touch on something um, a little bit different than what people so far have been talking about today. Um, so far, a lot of people have gotten involved because of some great um, or monumental thing that happened in their life that kind of motivated them to sort of make a difference themselves and start to take things into their own act and take things into their own hands. Yeah. Um, and that's amazing. If you have that drive within you, if you have that, that true calling that you just know that, oh, I need to go after this, then, then go for it. But for the rest of the people in the room, the people who kind of look here and wonder, well, I'm not like that. I don't have those. I never had some uh, huge moment to really push me to the next level. What, what do I do if I want to get uh, involved? Um, when I came here to Henry Ford, um, I had been, you know, like watching the news. I was mildly informed. Um, it was nothing more than just an interest, really, to me. Um, 
But it was something that I like to at least spend free time just sort of figuring out what's going on in the world at this given moment. Um, it wasn't until um, Nisreen, who I don't know if she's still back there, but um, um, Nisreen and Dr. Perry actually came to me and said, well, hey, you watch the news, you are informed. Um, we had this idea for this organization called MDICE, where we want to try to get students to be civically engaged and try to get them to um, go past their comfort levels to try to actually like take part in, the, in our democracy, really take that back and, and take that for themselves so that I really kind of realized that I could get involved in something bigger than me. And at the time I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, absolutely nothing. Um, and me and Nisreen recruited some people and we built up a, a, a base of really just our friends and we decided to try to do pretty much whatever we could. Um, we decided that the number one thing that most students deal with is tuition. Um, here at Henry Ford, I was thankful to pay uh, a lot less, but oh my God, going to U of M, U of M costs so much money. It's, it's insane. Um, but we decided to use that as our one real unifying rallying cause. And we went from there. Um, we decided that the best place to target was going to be the state legislature, um, which kind of knowing what I know now, if I were to go back there, I'd never think that that'd be possible. Um, but when you don't know any better, you don't know any better. And, and the sky's the limit. Um, and so we crafted a sort of rough policy, just an outline of things that we had found just by like um, doing research online. We'd found some programs that Tennessee had had um, that um, basically put in like a statewide FAFSA. And we uh, mocked up um, a one pager. We um, set up um, a, uh, a lobby day to go down to the nation's, or to go to the state's capital to go talk to our lawmakers. And we managed to get 200 students out to go and actually uh, talk to lawmakers. And it's crazy. I never would have thought that that'd be possible just like a semester before. Um, but we tried. That's all it took was just our us trying to do it. And we ended up going down there. We we're still fighting the fight. I mean, it, it doesn't end after just one one day. Um, we're actually going back in um, uh, this upcoming March. Um, but the one takeaway I think this entire experience has really, really given me is that the only difference between people who get things done and people who don't get things done are just whether you decide to show up. It's really that simple. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what you think you don't know. If you show up and you try to find other people to show up with you, then you're going to be able to learn from one another or at the very least learn for yourself, figure it out as you go along and just try anything. Um, and you'd be surprised what you can actually accomplish. So I guess just believe in yourselves. Uh, so anyone that knows me knows that I love, uh, so I grew up in the city of Dearborn. Um, I was born here and I, I born and raised in the city of Dearborn. And anybody that knows me knows that I love the city of Dearborn. Um, and like, I'm obsessed with the city of Dearborn. Um, like I've never leave the city of Dearborn. I plan to live here, um, raise a family here and then end my life here. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, it was in. 11th grade when I started taking uh, civic courses and I started learning about my city council and my mayor and I started uh, thinking um, that I never saw people like me who were there that represented what I wanted my values and my interests so I started going to city council meetings I started um, you know bothering the mayor a lot and I would go to the city council meetings and I would just sit there and I noticed that these politicians all they do is they, they would talk and they, they say these big words like photosynthesis and like <laughs> preposterous. Or, and they're not talking to the average voter. They're not talking to the average citizen. And they're not letting us know what they're doing. Um, and I noticed that uh, politicians, and I'm going to talk about politics because that's what I do. But politicians get nervous when people like us get involved. They get scared. They want to know, are they going to win their next election? Because when people like us get involved and we organize, 
you know, things will happen. But anyway, I, I, I was talking to the mayor and um, I knew that the mayor's election was coming up and I told the mayor that I wanted to get involved in his re-election campaign. Um, and he connected me with people. I got involved in his campaign and I, I, I went to uh, one of the meetings that his campaign was holding. Um, and I walked into this meeting. Um, I was 16 at the time. Like my mom, she dropped me off in her minivan and, and she had to come back and pick me up. But I, I walked into this meeting and it was a big room. And there, was, there were 15 guys, no women, 15 guys. And I said, if this is the room that's going to make the decisions for me, then Dearborn is not going to be the city that I'm going to live in. So I said, people like me, people who look like me, and people who represent my values and interests have to start showing up. So I went, walked into this room um, with 15 guys, and um, you know we were all sitting, we were all talking and standing, and then we all took a seat. And there was a, it was a, a, a square table with 15 chairs. Everybody, everybody took a seat, and I didn't have a seat. Um, and it wasn't until my boss, actually, my boss right now, he gave me a seat, and, and that was kind of like a symbol that I have a seat at the table, and I'm able to tell them about what my community wants and what my interests are. Um, and I know that was a little bit all over the place, but I, I think um, change is just a matter of uh, uh, including everybody. Um, so for me, uh, in 2016 and, and this year, I know we, should probably, we probably shouldn't get political, but um, I'm a big Bernie su uh, supporter. And in 2016, I supported him, and in 2020, I'm supporting him as well. And um, we saw that the Iowa caucuses were on Monday. Um, we saw them on Monday. We didn't get the results until today, but um, I, I had put a post on, uh, on social media earlier uh, that Bernie Sanders won the election. He got the most votes, and he, was, he won the election. And I said, this is what happens. The people win when everybody's included. And if you're involved or if you're involved or you're not involved, I think um, all of us have a duty to make sure that everybody is included and everybody gets involved. And I think it's just a matter of educating our community. I mean, a lot of people want to get involved in either political campaigns or, or what you're doing at school. A lot of people want to get involved, but they have that fear of getting involved. Um, I've been learning a lot about like psychology in the last year, and, and it's, it's proven that humans, we get nervous when we want to do something new or we want to learn something new. These people want to get involved. They, want, they see something going on in their city or in their community that's not right. They want to get involved and help change that. But it's up to us to uplift their voices and help them get involved. I mean, we're here. I mean, your advisors are here. People are here. And, and, and like Fatima said earlier, our phones are here. Social media is, is our number one, um, like, like that, that's where we go to, to communicate with everybody. Go on there, find an issue that you care about and get involved because that's the only way that we can change things. In sharing our individual unique stories tonight, we are hoping that you will understand that it doesn't matter where you're coming from in life or what journey you have been on, but you too can be a productive member of society. You can be civically engaged. There are 7.2 billion people on this planet 42% of those people are under 25. You are one of those people. 42% of the people on this planet. Imagine the power you hold in your hands if you stand up and speak up for yourself. Representation matters. He just stressed that walking into a room and seeing people that are going to be making decisions for you but do not look like you or they do not understand what you're going through can be very discouraging. It is up to you to stand up and take part. One thing that I got from Elias was that it doesn't take a huge event for you to get involved. You don't have to wait for the big bang for you to stand up or the writing on the wall to say, stand up, get involved. Every day is an opportunity for you to get involved. Whatever idea you have in your mind, that idea without action, it's only as big as the brain cell it occupies. You need to take action. Now, if anybody has a question for any of our panelists tonight, now would be the time. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming. Thank you very Thank you so much. much. Thank you for coming. 
I hope that as you live here tonight, you're going to be thinking about the ways in which you can get engaged, how you can change your community and the community at large. Thank you all for coming. Sorry. Sorry, Fatima. There's just two things that I want to stress on tonight, and and my goal. Come, sorry, and if you got to go, go ahead. There's just two things that I, I, my goal was to stress on tonight. Um, number one was, if you see people that want to get involved, teach them how to get involved and help them get involved. Find out what they're good at, because everybody has um, something special about them, and they can use that to make change. The second thing that I want to um, like stress on is. How many of you come from a community where you feel that your community is neglected? Something that we fail to realize that it, it doesn't always have to be about you or your community. Everybody is struggling. All sorts of communities are struggling. And if we expect people to stand up for us when our community is under attack, whether you're Arab, whether you're Muslim, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're gay, whether you're Latino, whatever it is, when your community is under attack, when you feel that, you, that your values are under attack, you expect people to stand up for you. you. You expect other communities to stand up with you. But you cannot do that unless you are standing up for other communities who are being neglected, oppressed. You have to stand up for everybody. And when we stand up with people and for people, that's when we can make a change and that's when we can make a difference. So I just want to stress out that you have to stand up for other people, not just you and your community. Thank you. Perhaps you guys have the last word for our people before we go. I want to stress the same thing again. Uh, you guys bring up social media and how important that is. And it is really important, but I also strongly believe in following up with that with as much in-person contact as you can possibly do. Because like I said earlier, uh, you know, Senator, or I keep saying Senator, it's Secretary of State Benson brought up um, the fact that they saw hundreds of young people between the ages of 18 and 25 registering to vote same day voting and that's not a coincidence that's that's a ripple effect they want they see young people voting and then they want to go vote and if you tell them that you're voting and you you bring up these important conversations they'll want to do the same thing so it's very important that you make these not just social media but that you bring it into your daily life because it does affect your daily life and politics controls everything that you do and you can do. So okay. Just before everyone um, heads out here, I just want to um, remind everyone that, um, well, first, thank all of you guys for coming. Um, yeah, this is amazing. Thank you guys so much. Um, but also, tomorrow we will be having um, the second part of this event um, where um, we'll have some more panels, but um, um, most notably, we'll have um, uh, workshop sessions on how to actually advocate and fight for an actual issue. So please come to that. It'll be really good, really informative, and we'd love to see you there. Okay, I'm just going to say it again. The Great Hack on Netflix and elections are in a month. <laughs> So you can volunteer either by registering someone to vote. You can work at the polls, especially if you speak another language. That's very important because there are a lot of people that don't understand English that you need to translate for. Um, work for a candidate. There's, you can search up Students for Bernie online or Students for Joe Biden or whoever you choose. But I recommend Students for Bernie. Um, and work for the polls. You, like they said, you can get money and compensation for it. Even the training, you get compensation for it. Work at the polls is one of the best things you could do and be civically involved. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Does anyone hear me? Does anyone hear me? I just wanted to thank Professor Robert. Professor Robert. I wanted to thank Professor Robert for encouraging us to attend this event. Thank you. Sorry, guys, I just had to those two points up. No, you're fine. Yeah, I'm like starting to do the same thing you did, like start to look at Yeah, I'll hit it from the top. Like when you put this much, Marlon, you can put this.
<laughs> whitewash, but you gotta stand up for us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're the last ones, and we're the like the least. 